Um, we'll have some appointments to both Conservation and the Historical Commission. I'll take those out of order due to travel uh, obligations on the part of some of the nominees. We'll continue forward for an amplified sound permit for flag football. Um, listen to a change of managers for Chili's and then spend a fair amount of time talking about a uh, alleged liquor violation in the town of Reading. Continue a hearing regards a four-way stop sign at the corner of Sunnyside and Fairview. Uh, and then continue the discussion about complete streets, a uh, proposal to continue to improve the streets for bike, walking, and other uh, physical exercise type activities, running, et cetera, uh, and discuss kind of long-range planning for the town of Reading, what's been termed Reading 2020. The Board of Selectmen met a few weeks ago, almost a few <coughs> months ago now, and talked about uh, focusing on four major areas. We'll talk about that tonight and finish the evening with uh, our evaluation of the town manager and then a review of minutes. Before we go to uh, our liaison reports, I did want to take the um, appointment of two historical commission members out of order. And I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Ensminger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just before this meeting, the uh, volunteer appointment subcommittee was able to meet with two candidates for two openings on the historical commission. Uh, first candidate was Jonathan Barnes. He's a <coughs> former member of the Community Planning Development Commission. I think I actually served with John uh, during one of my terms in the early, the latter part of the 80s. Uh, he's retired now and seeking uh, to move on to some uh, other endeavors. Uh, Ron Weston is a retired engineer uh, who has had a lot of uh, interplay with the Historical Commission working on the Old South uh, Bell Tower restoration. So we're very pleased we can offer a uh, position, uh, one being a full term, one being a, an associate term to both these gentlemen. So I'd like to make uh, the following motions. Uh, move that uh, Ronald Weston be appointed to the Historical Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2017. Uh, do we have a second? Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Four zero. And move that Jonathan Barnes uh, be appointed as an associate member of the Hist Historical Commission with a term expiring June 30th, 2015. Do have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, and I'll defer Four. the rest of our nominations till later. Four zero. Thank, Thank you for indulging that. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for putting that out. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to entertain the Selectman's Liaisons report since the last time we met. John? I actually have nothing to report. Not Great. available. <laughs> Dan? Well, in addition to the Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee, I, I was uh, privileged to uh, be asked by the Garden Club to uh, help judge the uh, Dofton Island uh, competition. Uh, we have over, I think, 100 islands and areas near intersections and towns that have uh, been planted by just islands. I, I think it's it's got to be near a hundred that's amazing it just it's, it can be an island it can be an area on a corner and so we have a strip right out of, in front of town hall here that is actually one of our candidates so uh, we were able to do that on Friday uh, we had two teams one doing the north part of town one doing the south, south part and uh, the, I will not spoil who the winners are, but the Garden Club is coming for us, I think, on September 2nd to announce the winners, and they may have a press release prior to that. So very good. Uh, on, on, that's on the lighter side of things, and that, that was very enjoyable. <laughs> Kevin? I have no comments at this time from uh, liaison reports. Thank you. Um, for myself, I attended uh, in the last two weeks a meeting of the Historical Commission to entertain a demolition delay for property on Summer Street. The um, meeting was very well attended, standing room only, and in addition, the chair, who did a marvelous job maintaining order, had a number of letters written from those that couldn't attend. Um, town Council is here this evening in part to respond to some of the questions that I heard out of that and that others may have. Um, but it's clear that the community is, to a person, unified about the, their view on the outcome. And here on the board, we're, we're frankly interested in making sure that the laws and bylaws that govern the disposition of both buyer and seller and the public's interest are maintained. So um, 
again, it was a it was a very well behaved group, despite the nature and um, importance of the discussion to the neighborhood. Um, with that, uh, Marcy, thank you for coming. You've been traveling a long distance. I have traveled a long distance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, we're just here on uh, Selectman Liaison's reports. I wouldn't expect you to have any of them, but perhaps you do. I, I actually do have something. I talked to um, one of the uh, members of the, of the other community's uh, community advisory board members for the Red and Blue Light today, um, who just wanted to express um, his concern about the fact of the sale of the bucket trucks at mm -hmm. $350. And he was concerned that he, he felt like the commissioners were perhaps not taking it as seriously as he would have hoped they were, um, and so he did want to express that concern and pass that along. So. And to that end, I hope we, well, not hope, we will have a following Board of Selectmen meeting where uh, I will extend an invitation to the other served towns for all, the sole reason of hearing the final report that we received from our, our town accountant. Um, there are no other comments. Um, I'll open the floor to public comment. I'll ask you if you do have something to say to please rise, please introduce yourself, tell us your address, and then uh, let us know what's on your mind. Is there anyone here for public comment? Well, this may be a record. <laughs> Should we all stand at once? Oh, okay, everyone's here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Seeing, seeing, I think we're going to have somebody here. If you have a spokesperson. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Luffy, 167 Summer Avenue. Uh, um, I and my husband, Joseph Luffy, are here on behalf of the 01867 <coughs> Neighborhood Preservation Association, which we formed last night. Oh. And we are very eager mm -hmm. to have you uh, listen to our plea that we are a somewhat of a better community on our street. It's been named a wonderful street by World News and Report. And um, we are very much against the idea of Criterion Children's School coming in and uh, disturbing that serenity. And Thank you. I think we have other issues. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak, sir? Robert Corwin, 199 Summer Ave. Uh, I too. Uh, part of the association <coughs> last night. And essentially, uh, I think what we're also looking to do is just to formally request the town help us in, in as much as you said, in, in investigating the legal um, avenues that are available to us. And, in, and we understand they, you know, everyone has rights here. Um, so, but we do want to understand what ours are specifically as in the towns um, we're going to be doing what we can do whatever that's going to be we don't know yet um, there's been a number of as you mentioned the uh, at the historical commission meeting uh, a number of questions came up that were not able to be answered and they were kind of legal in nature regarding the bylaws so we want to stress I guess that you know Implore that the town council, you know, get involved as heavy as they can, and we understand they're new to the town as well. So we don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they're new to Reading. I don't think they're new to some of the land use issues. So. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I think um, most of the folks here tonight. Uh, last night we had about 75 folks at our meeting. I think most of the folks here tonight, save uh, I'm sure a handful, are here for the same reason. Just want to kind of emphasize as much as we can you know, the importance it is to us uh, and hopefully to the town in general. I understand. Thank you. And Mr. Corn, just to clarify, my understanding is the limit to the Board of Selectmen is as the last recourse to an appeal to the demolition delay. That's not in dispute. The applicant for the building has um, fully accepted the six month delay. Our, our recourse is simply to challenge that. If there was a challenge, there won't be. The balance of this, I believe, will all come down to what is. What are the laws and bylaws that govern this, both at our level and as they relate to this this Dover amendment? Correct, correct. Yeah. And anything else you guys can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yeah, Bob Salter, 247 Summer Avenue. Maybe you received the letter that I sent it last night. night. It, 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 uh, but I think that um, <clears throat> in addition to what you're talking about, 
I think that uh, based on this, what I know or have learned in the last couple of days about the uh, Dover Act that will uh, be used to build uh, or dem build a new pro uh, a school on that property if, if it so happens. Um, uh, we'll be able to bypass all sorts of laws and regulations that we have here in Reading. And it, I think the selectmen really need to consider to act in such a way that uh, you might be able to have more control than just challenging the Dover Act uh, by potentially uh, incorporating that property into the historic district, which is just around the corner, the block next to it. And I, I certainly think that there are probably people on Summer Avenue uh, who own houses that wouldn't mind being incorporated into that same historic group. Uh, and so, uh, given that you only have six months, and we might only have one town meeting in that time, I think you really need to consider being proactive rather than reactive to uh, what comes down. Town Council will be the final judge. We, we talked somewhat about this moments ago, and my understanding is if it were, uh, first of all, the property has already been put under, as I understand it, a contingent purchase and sale. PNS. And as such, you couldn't retroactively declare it part of the historical Probably not. district. Mm -hmm. Even if you could, it would impact only the demolishment of the building and the preservation of the building, not the proposed use because Correct. as a structure, it would be remain intact. So, and such a district would dictate nothing about its use, but I'll defer to town council who has much more uh, color on the, on the subject. Um, as I said at the opening, at my opening remarks, we've got both buyers and sellers and um, members of, town, members of uh, the town that aren't necessarily abutters who all have interests the rules of engagement and the laws and bylaws already exist. And our task is really to ferret our way through that to find out which apply, which don't, and where there's ambiguity, raise that up and try to get clarity. You, on the other hand, have, I think, taken a pretty important step, which is formulate a group. And you'll undoubtedly get counsel of your own. I mean, it's not uncommon in this day and age for attorneys to disagree. It happens all the time. They're called trials. And uh, by all means, uh, you'll probably presume uh, pursue that of your own accord. Uh, we'll do the best we can from the town side. You have, you have my assurances. Well, I, I think the point is that uh, we trust the selectmen to look out for the best interests of the people of Reading. And um, in the current situation, I think there's a strong feeling uh, that uh, the sale of that property for the purpose is probably not in the best interest long term for Reading. And so anything that the selectmen can do, uh, rather than to observe, <coughs> is uh, something that needs to be done very quickly. Thank you. Understand. Sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, John Freitas, 70 Howard Street. Um, I appreciate um, your um, discussion, your, your opening remarks anyways, and I totally understand where you're coming from, uh, how you have to enforce the town bylaws and things like that. And I just want to have a realistic expectation of what we as a committee, I'm part of that 01867 committee, uh, can expect in regards to the town council. I mean, are they going to be looking, I know they're going to look at the obviously Dover Act and the, and the bylaws and things, but are they going to look at the, the, the actual entity itself, uh, Criterion Childhood Development, as to whether in fact they really are a nonprofit organization or is this, you know, um, something that the, the organization has to look at. I think the reason I asked the question is we really want to, time frame is short on everyone's behalf here. We just want to have a realistic expectation of what we can expect from the town fathers and the town council. Uh, Bob or Jean, could you describe just the overall process of a traditional sale and where in this case the town's interest in determining the Dover Amendment applicability would fit? Just describe how a sale would normally go down and then where in that process, since the Dover Amendment is likely to be applied here, when would our review of that applicability occur? Uh, sure. Jean Delios, Assistant Town Manager for Community Services. Um, so typically what happens and what has happened is um, an applicant will come to the <coughs> building inspector and in this case apply for a demolition permit, which is what has triggered 
um, the Historical Commission to hold a public hearing and determine um, the, the nature of the demolition <coughs> delay, which they have, and now that six-month clock has been set. So the next step is for um, them to begin the process, the permitting process associated with what happens after they demolish the building. And that permitting process could happen at any time. It could happen, um, it could start next week. Um, but as town council has advised us, in order for us to evaluate whether or not this would um, be uh, eligible for protection under the Dover Amendment, Mass General Law uh, 48, Section 3, that would be, we would need to see ownership. So that's the linchpin in order for us to be able to react to something. We need an application and we need to see demonstration of ownership. Can Um, town Council, would you make maybe clarify once ownership is presented what would happen now in terms of the review? Okay, well, typically um, a property owner would engage the town by filing an application, probably in this case a build, building permit application, but we'll leave it to them to decide what sort of application that they want to. Um, to file. So the so to be clear, the Dover Amendment says that no zoning bylaw um, shall prohibit or regulate or restrict the use of land or structures for educational purposes on land owned or leased by the Commonwealth or any of its agencies, subdivisions or public bodies politic or by a religious sect or denomination, or by a nonprofit educational corporation. Provided, however, that such land or structures may be subject to reasonable regulations concerning the bulk and height of structures and determining yard sizes, lot area, setbacks, open space, parking, and building coverage requirements. So, um, so there's basically two parts uh, to determine whether they're eligible for Dover Amendment. Uh, one is, are they a nonprofit educational corporation that owns the land? Uh, and the second is, are they going to be using the property for educational purposes? Those are not the same thing. Each one of those tests has to be met. Um, the um, typically, uh, the town would not engage on that subject. That is. I, it would be unusual for me to render an opinion about that stuff until there's an actual application in front of us. So what we would expect is that the, the property owners' uh, lawyers would have to make the case that they, in fact, qualify that they meet, meet uh, both parts of that test to be eligible for the Dover Amendment protection. Um, so um, uh, under your zoning bylaws, the, uh, uh, the building inspector would uh, uh, refer this to what's called limited site plan review, uh, where uh, the issue of, <coughs> of its applicability would be heard and a determination would be made that would be made advisory to the uh, building inspector. And uh, the building inspector would then E either accept that advice or, or most likely accept that advice and uh, make a decision and then that decision will be appealable to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So um, at the town level there's at least two hearing processes that are likely to occur before, uh, before the matter is, is resolved and before anybody goes to court. So, um, uh, but but it is up to the applicant to come forward and, and demonstrate that they qualify for Dover Amendment protection. Now, um, the, um, uh, I have seen the Articles of Organization of the, of the Corporation, it does have the word educate in there. Um, and um, um, the, uh, and, I, and I've seen a brochure of the services that they provide. Um, but um, I wouldn't want to um, advise anybody about whether they qualify un until I saw why they think they qualify and then make them uh, 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 prove it to uh, the satisfaction of the town. Um, 
So, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the decision makers here are reactive, uh, which is to say they don't have any, any decision to make until somebody asks them to do something. So until there's an application in front of us, uh, uh, there isn't really a, de a, a, a decision that can be made. Uh, but we do expect that an application may happen sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, apologies. I should have introduced uh, Mr. Ray Miares, uh, the counsel for Miares in Harrington, who's our, our new town council. A little bit of a trial by fire here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm very excited to have uh, been selected and, uh, and um, look forward to working with everybody. Uh, 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 I've already had the pleasure of, uh, uh, of uh, working with Bob a little bit and with Jean, and uh, um, 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 they're throwing a lot of things at me, and I'm swinging at the ones I can. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Um, before any, I take any other questions, Kevin, you had a second hand. Yeah, up. just uh, um, real quickly, maybe either, um, either one of you could answer. In relation to, I guess, the timeline, just so everyone's um, clear on it, and the demo delay has been issued, correct? Um, they've accepted it. Uh, at what point, I would assume most businesses would want to know if they can do business in this town before they did anything such as demolishing a structure. But technically, that doesn't sound like that has to fall in that manner. That, that could actually, the structure could be taken down after the six months, and then they could apply. Is that, that correct? Technically, that, yeah. Yeah, that could be, uh, but you're right, it doesn't seem as... Uh, you, it, you, it doesn't you, seem that that um, that somebody would invest the, in the cost of taking down the building unless they were pretty sure that they were going to be able to right okay uh, to proceed uh, to build the next thing. You wouldn't think, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Just a follow -up. Sure. Um, well, welcome, and we think you're wonderful, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right. I just want to be crystal clear on this. Uh, you have to review the application and. For, but if, would you go so far as to question the um, uh, viability or the, the um, like if they say we're a nonprofit organization because we educate, we do this, we do that and that, would you challenge those particular things? Or uh, That's why I'm just trying to um, see what your role is and where it starts and where maybe private counsel has to be retained. That's, I guess, what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Well, um I don't know if challenge is the right word, but I would, I would say what we do is we put them to their proof, that, right. which is to say they have the burden of demonstrating um, that they are eligible for Dover Amendment pr uh, mm -hmm. protection. So they will submit whatever materials and information they deem to be appropriate. We will review it. We're not shy about asking questions. Um, and um, uh, we will ultimately um, uh, give our advice um, probably in the, in the, in the uh, directly to the building inspector or maybe in the course of the, uh, of the uh, limited site plan review. Um, and um, what we, you know, the, the, um, uh, I certainly, when the time comes, I'm certainly open to having input from anyone who thinks they've got something important to um, to add so that Would you like to you come to your office often? <laughs> 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 I go through Bob, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, sir, yes, please. Hi, Ian Garland, 189 Summer Ave. Um, I don't want to be redundant, but I want to be just really crystal clear. So we cannot try to apply for um, a historic um, District, district if there's already assigned PNS. Is that no, correct? Uh, uh, refer to the one in the room. <laughs> or one yeah, of them, anyway. Is that correct? Um, I hate to, to contradict the chair on my first uh, meeting, <laughs> but, um, uh, but no, that's not quite that's right. That's not quite um, I think what, what um, there is no historic district now. If, they, if a historic district were proposed, um, then um, the um, it would be applicable to all new permits that are you know, all new permit applications. Unfortunately, there's already a demolition permit, permit, permit. application, so that's really the the stumbling block. Um, which is not to say that this is a that, that this is a bad idea. I 
don't know whether it's a bad idea or a good idea yet, but it, uh, but if you were to get a historic district bylaw in place soon, it would apply, it, it could potentially apply to the, the follow-on permits, sure. that is the, the new structure. Um, and, um, and as we indicated, um, the new structure, the, 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 uh, the applicant probably wants to know whether they're going to be able to build the new structure before they tear down the old one. So, um, so um, uh, this idea was only presented to me just before the meeting. <laughs> uh, and I can't say that I have thought every aspect of this through, um. but, um, uh, but uh, there's at least a kernel of an idea there. Okay, my, my other question is, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, do they, so they do not have to apply for the Dover Amendment until after the purchase and sale the house is closed on, correct? They don't apply, make that application? Well. They probably do their permits before that. They'd want their permits before they close. No, on most real estate um, transactions of this sort are, the purchase and sale is contingent on getting right. certain permits. And so, um, no, we, it's not correct to say they have to close before they can apply, but they can't act on the permit until they close. Okay, so they potentially could not be eligible and have own this property. Is that correct? Well, again, I, I don't know what's in the purchase and sale agreement. Right. I'm unlikely ever to know what's in the purchase and sale agreement, but in the, one would expect the purchase and sale agreement to have a provision that allows the buyer to walk away if they don't get the permits. So it seems to me unlikely that they would end up owning the property without getting the permits. Okay. And my last thing, I won't take up more of your time. Um, if this company was a non-profit company is tied to a for-profit corporation in their tax, public tax filings, would that um, make them potentially not eligible? For this government? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it would depend on the circumstances. So that needs to be investigated. And that would need to be investigated, yes. Thank you. Right, just for the record, you can correct me anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> and please do. Okay. I just, just, Sorry, no. Charlene. Okay. Um, I'm Charlene Reynolds Santo um, uh, on the Reading Historical Commission. And there is currently an historic district bylaw in town. Mm -hmm. So we do already have the bylaw. Um, one of the things I, I do kind of want to take the opportunity to um, say that if we still had the 12 month delay, we might have a little more power on this. It would not, if it changed tomorrow, it would not have anything to do with this structure. But I want to take the opportunity to add that in there. Um, we had questions at the hearing regarding the Dover Amendment, and you've addressed that, and also regarding the transfer of ownership. Um, how, in, according to our bylaw, that if the um, we have a demolition delay right now, and it is the, or how does that impact when the current owner transfers it to the next owner? I, I'm not sure that we covered that at all in our in the bylaw. I, I'm not sure, but that would be a question that um, we do want to get answered. Uh, maybe it just goes along with the building permit. If the building permit transfers to the next person, then this does. And that okay. sounds logical. So, but so the the an the general answer is um, that a demolition permit is just like a building permit, and it mm -hmm. can be applied for and obtained by one person and exercised by a new owner. Okay. Uh, um, the, so as a general matter, that's, that's mm -hmm. the case. Um, um, during the six month period, there are probably, the demolition delay by law probably has, I say probably because, you know, I right. didn't get a chance to look at it, yeah. but um, it probably has provisions, m most of them have provisions, that, that suggests that the owner has to take certain steps during that six month period. Um, and um, the, um, and I, I'm sure that everyone will be watching carefully to make sure that those steps are in fact followed. Any other questions or public comments? Sir. Uh, Frank Keene at 105 King Street. I just have uh, one observation. Um, I've been in town for about 43 years, and as this process continues, 
I don't think you're ever going to see a more lopsided scorecard relative to those who are against versus those that are for. I think right now it's the town against three. Um, so if others are pro this, I would like to have them come and present their case to the selectmen and let them tell you why this is going to be beneficial to the town. As a group here, we're telling you why it isn't. We'd like to give them an opportunity to come and say why the town's going to benefit from this. And I've asked the selectmen to inquire of them to do that. Just, just to respond to that, our latitude here is largely to make sure that the bylaws and laws are followed. We, we don't get to weigh in on whether the merits of the argument are good or bad or whether there's 186 to 3. It's all about what do the bylaws and laws say and how do they apply here. And that's why we have um, town council to help us interpret that because some of this is not clear, particularly those not schooled in the law. So I appreciate the lopsided nature. By the way, if anything, it's getting bigger, not smaller. So, but that doesn't, that's not, that's not germane to the outcome of this. The yes, the there is a question. There is an old saying, the Supreme Court reads the election returns. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to take folks that haven't spoken yet, then I'll return. Ma'am? Hi, I'm Demetra Tsekras. I'm over on Oak Street, 106 Oak, so I don't live in the neighborhood. Um, but I have friends who do, and I also am in that neighborhood a lot because I'm part of the morning and afternoon melee because I have a daughter <laughs> at Parker. <laughs> so I was heartened, sir, by what you said about the this amendment, and I know that if you know the Tabernacle, they, they successfully fought off some of the scope of that enormous building in Belmont because it was not reasonable. And when you said that the Dover Amendment allows for sort of jumping to the head of the line as long as things were reasonable, that gives me hope because I'm sure that the selectmen will vigorously do whatever is in their power to make sure that proper parking studies are done, that safety of kids is being looked at, that safety of residents. These residents have to put up with, you know, church parking on Sunday and then school, 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 school. Even in the summer, it's still going on. So I just hope that as much vigor you guys can bring to the table to help make sure that this project is reasonable if it does have to go ahead and fits in with the beauty of that neighborhood which means that our tax dollars stay reasonable, that would be really good. And thank you very much. I think you've seen the board do some of that with the recent um, proposal to use the St. Agnes building with regard to parking, with regard to public exactly. safety. So you, you can be assured those same kinds of assessments will be done here. Great, they're they're applicable. In the back, sir. Yeah, uh, David Godwin, uh, 189 Summer as well. But towards your last statement, my understanding is that uh, was not going to be a school, but it was going to be an apartment. And so my understanding is that some of the rules and regulations, if it does come in under the Dover Amendment, uh, could be bypassed. So things like traffic are not explicitly listed in the amendment. So that is a concern of ours, is that by passing that rigor, uh, you know, those things will be bypassed and then hurt uh, the town. Yeah, if you're speaking to a board tonight that isn't fully aware of what applies in the Dover Amendment case or not, it's a <coughs> unusual case. My only point is, my assurance is we'll do whatever we can to be fair and impartial in the application of the law. Just a side note to the reasonableness argument. Uh, Gene, you can correct me if I'm right on this. Uh, Fall Town Meeting did enact certain uh, setback and height requirements on schools and other uh, properties like at, at churches. There were none previously. So we, we could have literally had a, a temple be built to uh, 100 stories here before that was passed. So we do have bylaws in place right now to, to govern that. Any other comments? Mr. Salter, yeah. Uh, yes, um, given that town council gave a glimmer of hope to the idea <laughs> of, of putting a historic overlay over that property that might affect new building permits, and um, given the fact that there's a um, special town meeting probably in September, um, when, when would uh, something need to be in place in order to make it in the special town? Uh, August 15th, we're closing the warrant. Well, I think actually the board will probably close the warrant on September 2nd. Oh, we that's a do change. it that late. Okay. It's probably better. Okay. Right. So the All language right. so in advance of September 2nd. So that's one week. That's very close. It is. Yes, it is. Okay. And so. And that's when the language has to be finalized by an attorney. Correct. All right. But Checked by this. What, what we heard in the meeting yesterday is, is the historic 
committee was a little bit frustrated that they have no teeth other than to delay a six-month decision. But if there was a historic overlay over that property, they would have a little more power to impose some additional oversight. And given that, and that there might be a glimmer of hope, I would hope that it is in the best interest of the selectmen in order to have a play here rather than be a victim of the Dover Amendment. And, and with that, there's an urgency uh, that's only a few days away in order to get it done. And so rather than just wait, I think that you do have a play here and you should take it. Bob, what would be the process to craft such a document? Would it be something that would be sponsored by? I, I think Ray would first need to look at what we have existing to see if it applies. Um, undoubtedly, town meeting would have to approve something, right. but the question is what? what? If we already have a process to establish a historic district, what they approve might be relatively small. Here it is. Here's another district. We only have one so far. And just to be clear, it's not the uh, historical commission that will have any authority over this. A new group will have to be formed. There's a West Street Historic yeah. District, as, as Charlene knows. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I may, I just want to ask the group a question, and, and you can let me know the answer. If, if one of you would volunteer to be sort of a lead contact for us, that would be really helpful so that we can keep the group aware of whatever communication should be passed back and forth, and you, you just need to tell me that later. You can imagine I think I know big. who it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine a group this big and this diverse, it's really tough to get communication, so having that one person that broadcasts it and, and vice versa would be very helpful. Point of clarification? Sure. August 2nd or September 2nd? September, September 2nd. September 2nd. So in, in terms of uh, uh, the town council had mentioned earlier about keeping him informed of any, or them informed of any uh, per pertinent information. Um, would that then, you prefer that half funnel to him half? Through, through Bob. It should all go through yeah, the town. Through me. Yeah. Through Everything Bob. goes through Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Question? Yes, uh, please. David O'Connor, 210 Summer Ave. Does any of that remain uh, private or privileged information? If it's community, it's not, right? It would be subject to FOIA or if anything that we were to communicate to the town manager or town council would. I've been wrong once tonight, so let me turn it <laughs> I'm married, I'm wrong constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Guilty. So the attorney client. Privilege, privilege when you would it applies and it actually supersedes the public records law and and so uh, what that means is that communications between town officials and me are privileged it's up to them to decide it's not up to me to decide it's up to them to decide whether they want um, to release the information or not okay. it's completely up to them communication to whom it's released right and, and to whom it, well what once it's, it's released it's public yeah. oh. Once it's released, it's public. So your communications to Bob are just like any other communication to Bob. You don't get any special protection, even though it, you're thinking it's intended ultimately to come to me. No, I'm, but not, I'm that, thinking the opposite, which is why I asked the question. Okay, yeah. so, it's all. so um, um, you should not assume um, uh, that anything that you say to Bob, um, any document that you give to Bob in particular, would be protected from from um, uh, disclosure if somebody were to ask for it. Thank you. So the neighborhood point person is who? Just introduce yourself, sir. Here's our new person. Just introduce yourself, please. Ron Weston. Our, our newest member of the historical committee. Welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Good time for you to, to, to be here. <laughs> Curiosity. I didn't see a feeding frenzy about the uh, Mary Ellen O'Neill. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll just mention that Cinder Romer is the um, chairman of the group, and I am the vice chair. And we're working together, we have other um, officers and a large group of interested um, residents and citizens. Thank you. Any other comments or public, uh, public comments this evening? Thank you all. Thank I have a question. Before we leave, John? Just for purposes of my own clarity, so that I'm following the bouncing ball correctly. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to attend the historic meeting, just kind of just health concerns. But 
and these probably would have been answered for me, but for my own purposes, and any appropriate person can speak out to answer these for me. It's my understanding that the current ownership is being maintained by the original homeowner. Is that correct? But that there's a active PNS. Is that correct? To our knowledge. Yeah. That's I mean, okay. that's so that makes me think that the application for the um, <coughs> demolition permit was made by the current homeowner. Correct. 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 Okay. And so, um, in order to have a building permit, Gene, you mentioned that ownership has to be identified. So that ownership, despite an existing PNS, which is private information, whether that's in play or not is really kind of secondary. Um, a building permit would be applied for, I'm assuming if that happened sooner, would be done by the current owner, correct? Possibly. Okay. And so um, what I understand about an expanded historic district, I want to ask you this, Ray, is that um, the demolition permit cannot be impacted by the uh, by a new historic district overlay. Is that correct? It seems to be correct. Yes. Okay. And so, um, the person who has this permit can tear this property down in six, in six, six, six months, months. Right. Regardless. Regardless. Mm -hmm. That's that's the right of that person. That's right. Okay. New historic district would obviously have an implication on a new building. That's correct. Okay, so it sounds like this is really about a sense of urgency uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of, you know, any, I mean, if there's action towards a historic district and so forth, and everything else is really pretty unclear at this time. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, that we really don't know uh, the nature of any PNS. We have a thoughts that there's, you know, a group that we, this criteria group that we've heard about. So I, I'm asking these questions just so that in my own head, um, I mean, I mean, I've been able to read scores of uh, letters that have been sent to me and, and to my brothers and sisters here, and, and I certainly understand, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I get why everybody's where they are, um, and it makes a lot of sense to me, but, um, there seems to be seems to need to be some kind of focused energy um, instead of um, only. I mean, it's, it feels like we're blasting a shotgun at this problem instead of you know taking a rifle shot at it, and that seems to be the more appropriate course of action. I, I was I was really happy to hear in the early remarks that there's a local association that is coming it together. Um, I'm hoping that they, that that gets legs in maybe a more legal way and, um, and understands that people have the opportunity to maybe do something very powerful from a citizen standpoint um, because it's my understanding from everything I've heard tonight and you know what you've prefaced your remarks John is that there are significant limitations as to uh, you know, we, we sit as the as the board looking out. I mean, we're we operate at the pleasure of the citizens. We're elected as their representatives to look out for their best interest. But there are some limitations as to you know what we can do there. Exactly. You know, it, it kind of needs a you know a citizen groundswell in order to be able to get take the steps in a timely, expedient fashion in order to get the desired results. So I just kind of say that as a as an open statement to everybody in the room, just kind of from my perspective. Just to amplify your points, I think the two points of urgency are one, um, establishing for your own self what, uh, and doing an investigation of your own self as to the applicability of this this proposal uh, to, to be covered by Dover. Your your own counsel should give you that, right? Uh, and the second is the institution of an additional historical district and getting that language, if we're going to do it, in a form ready to be seen by town meeting in early September. I'm sorry. I'm in the back. I'm sorry. I'm the I have a quick question. Send a Romer 176 somewhere, Avenue. This would be for town council and possibly Charlene. Um, it's my understanding under that, that, that um, six-month demolition bylaw that the current owner 
um, is supposed to work um, with, the, with the historical commission to possibly seek an alternate solution and an additional buyer. And it's my understanding at the meeting last week that she said she couldn't because she was under a purchase and sale. And I thought that it's a condition of the bylaw that that's good. one of the things she's supposed to be doing is working to find an alternate purchaser for the property to be able to avoid the demolition. The, unfortunately, there's nothing in the bylaw that says that they don't work with the historical commission. This is what happens. Oh, so there's no teeth to that. Could it invalidate the, the bylaw in general? I don't think so. And they would have to start. Maybe over. council would like to say that I'm wrong. Probably need to let Ray get okay. a few more minutes on the books yes. here. <laughs> Okay. He's blushing so. already here, so. <laughs> uh, so it seems unlikely to me that mm -hmm. uh, even th even though there's a requirement that they that they cooperate with the historic commission to find a new buyer and whatever, all of those terms are pretty loose. What is constitutes cooperate and whatever. Plus, at the end, there's no consequence for failure to do it. So um, the uh, in legal terms. That provision is called it is what we call directory. It tells you to do something, but it doesn't attach any consequence to it. So um, I wouldn't um, um, uh, I I wouldn't view the failure to um, uh, to cooperate as a way of invalidating the demolition delay uh, permit. Or the, I'm sorry, the demolition permit. Um, and the fact that there is no teeth is certainly not a, a basis for invalidating the bylaw. There are loads mm -hmm. of bylaws that have no teeth. And, uh, um, uh, and, and it's, it's sometimes it's precisely because they have no teeth that they are indeed valid. So. Any other comments or questions? Uh, just one other thing, in terms of, the, back to, uh, the, the, as part of the, uh, the requirement having the uh, owner work with the historical commission to find alternatives. Um, it's not the association's intent to stick it to the current homeowner. And in our discussions that we've had, you know, we thoroughly want to work with her and try to find an alternative solution. But that the, uh, a viable solution may require the town to bend some of its rules that are currently in place that maybe have previously been enforced upon her that have gotten us to this point, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to just kind of make the town aware that we may need some of that latitude to make a compelling argument for her to leave what she's currently involved with if that's going to be the case and move to something to another solution that would work for her as well as everyone else yeah the seed i think i know exactly what you're talking about yeah, i do too and the mm -hmm. seed the seeds of some of tonight's discontent were sown years ago mm -hmm. right. and in fact none of the members of the board before you nor the town manager nor town, or town council, council. Especially, <laughs> not town. especially not town council <laughs> or staff or staff so in many ways the uh, circumstances that might cause some agita on the part of the seller are being misdirected, if you will, at a whole group of uh, other persons. Mm -hmm. So I get your point, and uh, we may not have the latitude you describe. I've made some inquiries this, this evening on those very points. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, there's a, there's a hand way in the back that I've, I've got to respond to. Yes. I'm sorry, but I think this might be a little hypothetical. If perhaps this owner uh, was taking taxes on this property. Would that negate the fact that it indeed was a historical property and now we have to keep it off? In other words, did, could she claim, my understanding is if you have a historical property, you're not allowed to take it tax deduction. Is that true? I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure that's not true. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Everett Blodgett, chair of the West Street Historic <laughs> District. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel my shoulder's getting heavier. <laughs> um, I would like to just make a statement that that committee be involved because I've heard under the umbrella, I've heard a new group, um, and I think under the last um, activity of about 12 months ago, when we had trouble people coming on the board, uh, just before that, and then that whole process became very trying. Uh, we're a relatively new group trying to hold up a very important section of history in our town. And we've missed the boat in uh, 85, and uh, we missed the boat a year ago when we uh, acted on the Historical Commission, and um, we didn't give them teeth, and we didn't give the town teeth, and we didn't give the majority teeth. And that, that really hurts, and that's going to hurt um, if, if this plays out. So I think it would be fair to involve the uh, present historic, um, Western Historic District, to make sure that we can have the input to say, this is what's working or not working, this is we feel how we can handle it. Uh, because basically, I think it's going to be really, really important. And there are two issues here. One is the building coming down, and the other is the building going up. Yeah, exactly. um, it's, and it's hard to separate the two. They are both very, very important. Um, from a historical point of view, it's the building going down. It's the first one. Um, and I would stress that I have been at meetings for historical reasons <coughs> where the Board of Selectmen has chosen, and I think it was Foster Emerson House. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the house that was on the um, Meadowbrook Golf Course, and the town made available a piece of land at a deal price so that that house could be saved. So there are times that options can become available, and we just don't know what they are. So say they're not, we don't have to do that, we can't do that. We just don't know what's in the wind right now. So um, I think we need to be open, or I think, uh, I think we have to, I don't think the right word is attack, but shoot from several single fire rifles and make sure we have the target. Uh, because uh, basically this is a pristine, example of our historical heritage. And just to follow that analogy one step further, it's really important to make sure what you're aiming at and th that it's clear and crisp and principled. Mm -hmm. So uh, said, that's the target. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the target. Yeah. Any other comments and questions? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet that wants to? Just one last question for um, the town council. The fact that there's no teeth in this bylaw, and the, and the fact that it says that, um, you know, she should hit the, the Binary. Again, I have no axe to grind by uh, seller. She can do whatever she wants with it, except this. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact that she, there's no teeth in the bylaw does that mean we just she just gets to do what it is, or do you uh, respond to them saying you're in violation of this bylaw, or what is? I, I guess I don't understand the sense of uh, having a bylaw if nobody's going to pay attention. There's nothing that can happen to you if you don't. The bylaw I think you're referring to is the demolition delay bylaw? No, the fact that she has to entertain other offers and discuss things. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's part it's of the requirement. part of the, of the demolition de delay bylaw. I guess I'm just, I'm just not clear on that. Is that something you would push back on? Unsuccessfully, I might have, but I don't um, The bylaw has requirements. We can certainly make inquiries as to whether the requirements are being satisfied. Um, uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean, though, that at, that that on the six month and one day, the, the building can't come down. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that remedy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like you you, you get to impose an you know no, no, an extension on the six months if they if they're not. Uh, but if I were the buyer, you can certainly make you can certainly make inquiries as to whether the um, the bylaw is. Uh, uh, is being uh, uh, complied with. So I guess my question to you as a follow-up is, if I were the buyer and you, and you were town council and you said, hey, I don't think all the elements of the bylaw are being upheld, that would cause me at least some concern. I'm not sure I'd go knocking down a building. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, is, that, is, that, <laughs> is that odd or is, is that uh, something that you would entertain? Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether it's I entertain it or not. not. It's only, it, only, it only matters, it only matters whether, whether the, the um, 
buyer uh, is concerned about that, and uh, you know I can't speak to that either. Thank you. The other, the other point I'll make is while the bylaw is the focus of this discussion, what really the, the confounding circumstance is the educational nature of the proposed use, which sets aside, which is really the rub. We have plenty of regulations yeah. for zoning and setback, and yeah. mm -hmm. those are largely rendered uh, moot, given the, with, with some exceptions, by the proposed nature here. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Uh, uh, the, the other piece of information is nothing beats having a room full of interested citizens at, at getting things done. And um, I can't tell you how impressive it is to get good behavior and well-formed questions and uh, questions that are on point. Nothing's more powerful than a reasoned argument. And uh, getting it from such a large group is, is even more powerful. One last question, Charlie. Um, one of the things about, about the demolition delay bylaw, where we want to use those six months to work with the owner, the, what has happened many times is that we get to talk to the owner, see what they want to do, help them it, maybe incorporate, keep a few walls, incorporate something that came from the previous structure, depending, and we work with them, and sometimes it gets released early because we've come to an agreement that, okay, you know, we're going to save these walls or something, then we can release it early. That's a lot of the encouragement of trying to work with us. That's where the meat of that part of it yeah. really sure. is. Cindy, I saw your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just have to add that in this situation, I don't think that would be the case. Yes. Because um, their request is for a 9,900 one level square foot structure with a 2,400 square foot playground with parking for 20 cars. They have no intention of maintaining any of that structure with supposed asbestos um, in, in the walls and all the lead paint if they're going to have young children in that property. There's not a chance in the world one piece of that house is going to stick. None. Because it, it can't. It's inherent in the, the type of business that they're going to be putting in there. There is no way that structure is going to come down. And I've read the whole application from the architect. They're, they have no intention of holding any of that. So in this case, I don't think that's going to be the case. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Why don't we take two minutes while the room clears here? Um, Allison is here. Yeah. Allison Stegg. I was going to suggest we throw this one. She's here. So we'll just go to that next. Okay. Okay. Meeting so to just, just add the map, yeah, yeah, add, I think so. change the map. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I don't think they need mean. complicated language, but no, I no. wanted you to make sure you review it. Well, I've and spent, I'll talk I've to Mary. I know, yes, also. exactly. <laughs> and I'll talk fine. to Mary Ellen. It I know her fine. well. Okay. But but so, that's it, so September 2nd is not a burden for them to, if they want to do this. It's not a burden. No, is it? No, no, no. All they have to do is somebody's got to produce a map of what they want included in the in the. Uh, to change the appendix. And of course, there's a hearing process that's <laughs> similar to the zoning yeah, process. Yeah, I have as to what process that is. They make uh, CPD Yes. Okay. So their meeting schedule is a and little bit. And then the other part of the other part of the other part of the other part of the other <laughs> so what is it you want? <laughs> uh, yeah, we might want to ask them. Yeah. Uh, you guys could uh, clear the room if, if you have if you have no other business before the board. If you so it, it looks like it's very simple. I spent five minutes on it, so now I'm at it. Guys, we're It looks like all they have to do is. The way this is set up, it's, there's one historic district, but there can be more than one district area. You don't have to have a new 
Historic commission. District. You don't have to do anything. You just have to remember the map. So, so you change the draw so another the, circle on so the map. So the West Street Historic <laughs> District would now incorporate <laughs> Summer Street no. as well. Well, well <laughs> that's the name. Just of the, rename it. <laughs> we'd have, I think <laughs> we'd have to rename it. Rename. Yeah, the Summer but, West Street. But it but the 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 bylaw says. The bylaw says the district shall consist of one or more district areas. So it comprehends as, it already. Yeah. As shown in Appendix B1. Now it turns out it's actually only Appendix A, but. <laughs> uh, Stand back far. Well, it looks like it. That's right. Um, but um, um, uh, it seems to me that all you need to do is to is to make a new map. Yes. So it's relatively trivial to do that. Yes. Some, I mean, it's not trivial to me. I wouldn't be able to do it, but someone would know. Where, <laughs> someone would know how. Yeah, where, by where September, to you will be able to do it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, that's I will not never his be, job. I that's will not never be job. able to do it. Someone has to decide okay. what's in it. And what's yeah. Not. yeah. Can, you couldn't spot um, to that map, could you? Here, this this house on this side. We've got a full some. agenda, folks. So let's go <laughs> on to uh, uh, to what's next. No, I didn't want to do I that. Didn't, that. Didn't think um, so. It being five after eight, at least according to our highly accurate timepiece on the wall. <laughs> um, what I want to take out of, uh, I guess it is in or, or no, out of order, is the um, uh, Conservation Commission uh, and Cultural Council and Cultural Council appointments. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, we uh, were happy to interview two candidates for the Cultural Council tonight: uh, Rosemary Lewis. 26-year uh, Reading resident and a lifelong supporter of the arts, and uh, Marianne Kozlowski, 30-plus year Reading resident, uh, longtime resident, uh, former member of the Recreation Committee, uh, both very interested in the position of Cultural Council. And also Allison Steger, who I believe is here tonight, uh, we have recommended for the uh, Conservation Commission. Allison's a recent graduate uh, of UNH, majored in Environmental Conservation and Sustainability, and uh, was also an in intern at Hancock Associates in the areas of wetland science. So I'm pleased to uh, make the following nominations. Uh, move to, uh, uh, to appoint Allison Steger to the Conservation Commission with the term expiring June 30th, 2015. Second. All those in favor? Now five zero. Move to appoint Rosemary Lewis to the Cultural Council with the term expiring June 30th, 2017. Second. All those in favor? And move to appoint Marianne Kozlowski to the Cultural Council with the term expiring June 30th, 2015. Seconded by Second. Seconds. All those in favor? 5 0. And we still have openings on other boards, which we hope we'll get some applicants for. Good. Well, congratulations mm -hmm. to the, to the new you. members. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, uh, we, we've uh, had about an hour discussion of public comment. Did you want to take us briefly through the town manager? No, I think we'll skip that and go right to Carl. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have an amplified we, we have an amplified sound permit here. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> you wait no okay. for that, you? Um, uh, to request an amplified sound permit for flag football. This is the third year, Carl, that we've uh, had this activity, and from what I've been shown. <coughs> Uh, enrollments are up strongly. So, Carl? Thank you. Hopefully, it won't take as long as previous. You're not tearing anything down or building <laughs> anything. <laughs> um, thank you for, for meeting with me. Uh, Jimmy Murphy, running resident, who was at, well, he was at a T ball game, so he wasn't able to make it. Um, tonight, and myself, this is our third year we've had uh, flight football. We, this is in <coughs> partnership with the Running Recreation, um, of which they certainly glowingly endorse our program. Our first year we had 200 kids. Last year we had 350. And unfortunately we're gonna have a waiting list of, we're at 500. And we actually did sue down the recreation department was, didn't really like us around 4th of July because this year instead of starting the regu registration August 1st, we did July 1st. By the 4th of July we had 350 people signed up. It was, uh, it's just crazy. Um, what Jimmy and I want to do and what we've always been able to do is really make this a community event. Uh, on average, we probably have a couple thousand parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles down there. Uh, and we'll have the cheerleader, high school football cheerleaders will do face painting. Uh, we, we hire the high school kids um, to officiate the games and the older divisions because parents are not 
cool enough to coach the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, kids. Um, <laughs> we have a high school football team players uh, coach the team. Uh, this year we actually started a girls only division, uh, and that's been gangbusters, which is, which is great. How many young ladies have signed up? We have over 60. Oh my goodness. Uh, which, is, which is a huge number. Um, mm -hmm. It is interesting, and in the younger divisions, Typically, the young ladies are better athletes. Sure. Uh, the hand-eye coordination, everything seems to be better. And it's always interesting when it's like a young boy who thinks he, he's going to be able to get the girl, and she just blows right by. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I told him that's life, but you know that's how it works. You know, one of the things that we, we always do, um, which is exciting for us, is we try bringing in the, the local businesses where we'll have a Portland pie night. Um, Cupcake City brings their truck down for kids to be able to do it. We try and make it really almost like the, the street fair in terms of bringing as many people as possible because we really want it to be a community. Um, the, the only problem we've ever had with um, the DJ that we had going on there was last year in kindergarten to first grade. We actually <coughs> stopped the game because Cotton Eye Joe was being played, and I don't know if that's like kind of like the dance where the bag teams actually had a competition who danced the best during the game and had to stop it. <laughs> that was the only problem we had with, with the music. Uh, John Fiore drives around in his car with the window down to make sure everything's there. Um, I always get nervous when I see Chief Cormier's vehicles coming by. I'm like, uh-oh, what happened? And usually the officer says to me, it's just like, Carl, where are all the kids? You know, there's no kids in town. They're all down here. Right. So we want to see what's going on there. Um, the, the crazy numbers are this year we'll probably have about 30 to 35 percent of the entire student body in, in the elementary schools at this event on, on Saturday nights. Um, we're very cognizant of the, the families that are along the Birch Meadow Drive on the Coolidge side. So we actually have the speakers point towards the, the open area. So it's, it's, there's nothing there. Um, the DJ is rated G, um, and it's funny sometimes, you know, a song will be on, they'll be on like Kiss 108 or something like that, and we'll hear something that is quote unquote acceptable to the FCC, it's not acceptable for us. <laughs> so we do a lot of screening of, of the material. Uh, a lot of the music is going to be what you hear at the, the Boston Garden, like Jock Rocks and stuff like that. And always, you know, we will rock you, that's always the famous song that we love to be able to do. Um, I would love to have any questions that you guys may have. Um, anyone come down? It's just such a community event. It's, it's a lot of fun because we're also incorporating the high school teams uh, because we're always looking to raise money. Where the, the, we'll work with the we're working with the boosters and the athletic director. Where one night the concession stand may go to the volleyball team, and one night the track team, so that everyone can be able to generate some some yeah. money from that. So. That way, it's just not a football only, but ready for any community. Carl, I remember the first year you applied for this. I, I was out on the board, but I remember there was a long discussion about the applicability of amplified sound, and it was relatively soon after that uh, regulation was created. Have you had, in the last year or two years, any recorded complaints, or do we know of any recorded complaints from neighbors? The, the only complaints is what, as I mentioned, in terms of a parent saying, you know, you know, Kanye West is not what we want to hear now. Yeah. You know, something like that where they're just saying to us, and typically when we hear it, it for, for some reason I just tune out the music. Sure. Um, it, but Jimmy hears it, and you can actually see him running towards the DJ saying, <laughs> I do not play Kanye West as an example. Um, but we've never heard anything from a, a community member. Coming to you know filing anything with Mr. Fudo or uh, the town manager. Is that true? <coughs> Is that true? Have you heard tell of any complaints? No, no, any complaints. Not aware. Nor do I. <laughs> Bob, is this a permit that you grant? Uh, um, in the past, the board has made a motion. We didn't put it in there because it's really the recreation committee's purview, oh, okay. and yep. this is more of a courtesy. But if you want to move to approve the amplified sound permit as presented, subject to approval by the recreation committee, that'd be fine. Oh, I will so move. <laughs> yeah, and I just a comment to that because mm -hmm. I happen to have been on the okay. amplified sound committee at the time when it was uh, the the ordinance was put together, and I also happen to be present the night that you applied for your mm -hmm. first permit to do so. And um, I think two things are true. Um, one of the things actually was that the the exception to the rule of amplified sound was that 
the yeah. Board of Selectmen would would hear, you know, a variance. And so you know, I, I was present, I, not on the board, I was present in the audience at the night that you made the application for the first such variance, granted it. And, um, and I think that the board at that time was very cognizant of amplified sound on a repeating basis. I, as I remember, Carl, this goes on for what, about six weeks or so, or something like that. We go seven weeks. Seven weeks, okay. Um, and honestly, I, you know, I think what Carl and Jim Murphy have done is create a great evening activity for families, for kids, and every time we have the opportunity to you know, make sure that there's more of that going on, we should endorse that. And furthermore, one of the things we, you know, those of, those of us who frequent such events realize that kids are really tuned in, they're kind of amplified now, yep. you know, I mean, they're tuned into the, to the sound and to the activity and to the, and to the, and to the music. And um, I think this is a perfect example of applying the variance to an organization that's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And I, I say that out loud from my perspective, that I think this is a good thing that we should endorse and, and vote for this evening. I can't think of <coughs> any other organization that grows 70% year over year, three years in a row. It's, it's amazing. Well, it's funny because one of the problems that we had was after the 4th of July, we're like, oh my God, we're running out of fields. Mm -hmm. And we actually opened up, and that's why we're, we're trying to find additional field space. Um, and Mr. Peter did a very nice job in, in Jenna juggling some time to mm -hmm. sort of accommodate everyone. Because we don't want to say no to anything. Fields have always been a problem in this town, and uh, we're always interested in finding new ways to solve that problem. So we have a motion. We have a motion. I forgot. Second. Second. Okay. We have a discussion. All those in favor of the motion will allow the amplified sound. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a uh, hearing for a change of managers of Chili's restaurants here in Reading. Is there somebody here? Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Rob Harris. From Chili's for 19 years. I was actually the general manager at the Danvers location for the last seven years, up around there. So I've um, been dealing with alcohol for a long time. So um, I haven't never had any issues over the last eight or nine years with anything since I've been a general manager. So if you guys have any other questions. Yeah, for the other members of the board, this, this is a hearing for change of manager. It principally involves um, Incidents, past incidents, alcohol, uh, right. uh, uh, licensing issues, alcohol, serving issues, etc. Very clean record. Okay. Any other discussion by members of the board? Okay. Bob, you have a motion? <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, move the Board of Selectmen approve the change of manager for Pepper Dining Incorporated, <coughs> DBA Chili's Grill and Bar, from Ron Dumont to Robert Harris. Any discussion? Any second? First second. Second. Second by Kevin. Discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. You here at you here at seven? Uh seven thirty. <laughs> <laughs> I caught the tail end of that. I was like, ooh. <laughs> we have a uh, public hearing notice to read. <clears throat> to the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen is the licensing authority for the town of Reading. We'll hold a public hearing on Tuesday, July 29th at 7 30 p.m. in the Selectmen's Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts. To show cause why Jay and Ricky Incorporated DBA Ricky's Liquor, retail package store licensed to expose, keep for sale, and to sell all kinds of alcoholic beverages, should not be modified, suspended, or revoked for violating GL Chapter 138, Section 34 on July 3rd, 2014, to wit, the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 years of age. All interested parties may appear in person, may submit their comments in writing, or may email comments to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us. By order of Robert W. Lalashur, town manager. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Chief? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to introduce Detective Robert <coughs> McHugh. Detective McHugh uh, is going to relay some information to the board of an investigation that he did uh, earlier, um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was a few weeks, about a month ago, I guess, huh? okay. um, relating to Ricky's Luckers. Um, and so uh, a little bit of history there is that we had received 
There's some information, anonymous tips that uh, there have been some sales to underage um, people at Ricky's Liquors. So as a result, the detective, while working in a patrol shift the particular night, was kind of watching the situation and observed some thing, some uh, some behavior, and he followed up on it. So he'll relay to you the facts of what he observed and the actions he took, um, and uh, will allege a violation on Ricky's uh, Liquors parts on sale to an underage uh, individual. Thank you. Second McKeon. Thank you. Uh, as the chief stated, uh, prior to July 3rd, the detective unit received information in regards to Ricky's liquor selling to underage kids. Um, on July 3rd, I happened to be working a patrol shift in the uniform in the patrol my car. And I happened to notice a vehicle pull into Ricky's liquor's parking lot, which consists of a convenience store, pizza shop, and nail salon. Um, the vehicle caught my attention due to the occupants appearing to be teenagers. I uh, continued to watch them um, as the two male rear passengers exit the vehicle and enter Ricky's Lickers. Um, I positioned myself inside the parking lot where I could maintain visual on the vehicle and on the store. Um, I could see one of the male occupants in the store walking around. I then observed him walk up to the register and then exit carrying a brown paper bag. I observed them walk back to the vehicle and enter the vehicle, at which point they exited the parking lot and drove northbound on Main Street. Um, at that time, I followed them, and I could observe the female driver continuously looking in her rearview mirror at me. The vehicle then pulled into Burger King parking lot and parked in the front facing Main Street, and all the occupants exited and entered the Burger King. Uh, for approximately 10 minutes or so, I observed all four occupants inside Burger King not purchasing any food, but standing by the exit looking out toward the main street. I believe that they were trying to not get pulled over. Um, about 10, 15 minutes later, they all exited. One male had a small bag of food. They entered the vehicle, at which point I uh, pulled to the spot next to them and exited my cruiser and approached the driver and asked to speak with her. At that point, I asked her if I could talk to her. She stated yes. Um, I asked if she was 21, she stated no. I asked if anyone in the vehicle was 21, they stated no. I then directed my attention to the male that I saw in the store. I again asked him if he was 21 years old, he stated no. At that point I began to question him on my observations from within uh, Ricky's Lickers. As I talked to the, the male party, he then admitted that he did buy alcohol from Ricky's Liquors. I asked him how he purchased the alcohol without an identification and the fact that he was under 21 years old. He stated to me that it's a known fact that Ricky's Liquors hasn't been carding and that word of mouth is getting out there and kids are going there to purchase alcohol. At that point I removed alcohol from the trunk that was consistent of the alcohol that I observed him carrying outside the vehicle. Um, it should be noted that the four occupants were all out from outside of town. They were from Medford and Wayfield. Uh, at that point, I seized the evidence and advised all the uh, occupants of the criminal charges to, that will be coming. On July 8th, I then followed up with the Ricky's Liquors and the store owner and the employee that was working that night. I advised them of the situation. Um, I asked if I could speak, see their uh, surveillance videos of that night. I then assisted the manager, or excuse me, the owner of the store with narrowing down the time frame of July 3rd where the purchase was made. During that time, I observed the mail that I charged enter the store, purchase the alcohol, and then exit the store without identifying himself. At that point, I requested a copy of the surveillance videos, and it, at which, as of today, we have not received. Your, um, is that the extent of your prepared comments? Right? Did you have any other, anything else to say? That, that's all. Awesome. Um, your prepared, your written comments suggest that you asked. I can't find it here. You asked one of the individuals how mm -hmm. long he'd been doing this, and he had remarked, "How long?" Approximately a month. And was that taken to be done it multiple times during Yes. 
Um, Any other questions from other members of the board? Yes, I, it's, I mean, this is some kind of secondhand. Uh, part of what I'm going to need to know tonight, is this a real pattern of, of a problem, or is this maybe something just started to happen? What I'd really like to know is if you've had it, will you have had any opportunity to review those surveillance tapes for other dates and times to see if you notice a pattern? Is that beyond the scope of what you can do? Is that getting into search and seizure? Because I'd like to know if this is a pattern other than just the say-so of this kid. Uh, I mean, that, they carry some weight with me, but I'd really like to know if this is a, a month-long problem. Uh, Without knowing who's actually purchasing yeah. the alcohol, we don't know if they're yeah, 21 or not. Yeah, it would be difficult to do that. Have you done compliance checks at this site before? No. So has this site ever received a, never since inception, it's never been checked? No, I don't believe so. They they were just recently licensed. Correct. Um, yeah, I don't thing. believe that we did compliance checks uh, since they've been licensed. However, I believe when they were first licensed and open, I believe that we did go and make a face-to-face uh, -face introduction and advised you know about the regulations and things like that. Uh, we normally would do that with new license holders. How long ago was that, Chief? Is yeah. sometime in the last six months? I believe they were. Uh, yeah. Probably ask when was the license issued? Four year now. It's been a year already. Yeah. I know the, the actual. You know the actual. Yeah, day. Vaguely June twenty fourth, I believe. Of uh, uh, thirteen. So thirteen months. Yeah. Um, did any of the other occupants make reference to independently having visited the store? Or was it sa that single individual? Just that single individual. Okay. Any other comments you remember of the group? Um, what light? Uh, uh, what latitude do we have here? You've, I've seen the comments in terms of. I think you should hear from the uh, door. I would like to hear. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Coleman on behalf of uh, Ricky's Liquors. I have with me tonight uh, the owner, uh, Cal Patel, as well as uh, Bruce Armstrong, who was the uh, clerk working on it that evening of the uh, July 3rd. Uh, we've heard the uh, I've heard the comments of the detective, and we've, we had an opportunity to read the report. Um, there's no question that selling alcohol to minors is, is dangerous and there's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for not checking anybody's ID uh, ever. Uh, Ricky's Liquors knows they've made a mistake here and they know there's going to be repercussions as a result of that. We don't question any of that. Uh, part of my concern for coming here tonight was the, the implication of some of the things that I read in the report might reflect badly on Ricky's Liquors. And uh, like you said, uh, some of that is the word of the one individual and potentially hearsay. I mean, if there, if the anonymous tips were coming in, and I don't, I don't, this isn't a court, so I'm not trying to challenge too much here, but if, there, if the anonymous tips came in on the 26th, there was a lot of time between the 26th and the 3rd to be checking this out, so I don't know why it had just happened to be on the 3rd that this actually happened. But, uh, you know, I think there are some mitigating factors that the, that the board should take into consideration. Uh, one is Mr. Patel, uh, who is the uh, manager uh, of record, uh, has operated a uh, convenience store, JK's Market, in this town for 20 years. He hasn't had any complaints or that I'm aware of. And they sell cigarettes and there's IDs checked in that instance, so I, I haven't, I'm not aware of any. On the day of the infraction, please don't take this as this is kind of an excuse for anything. It's an explanation. July 3rd, before 4th of July, at 7 or 8 o'clock at night is zero hour, I think, for liquor stores. And Mr. Armstrong <coughs> told me that a couple of stores in the area may have closed down early before uh, 9 o'clock to allow some of their employees to go. So it made the, the traffic in there even worse. And I, I think the detective will, will, won't disagree with it. There was a lot of people in there. Um, Mr. Patel uh, was working that day. He just didn't happen to be there at that time. So Mr. Armstrong was there by himself. He was there at 6 o'clock, and he came back at 9. The infraction happened in the interim. Um, I don't want you to think that this also was a case of somebody who appeared noticeably underage. Uh, I mean, if you see somebody who appears very young come in there, and they don't card them, that's you know, a big problem. It's a big problem you don't card anybody, but especially is more problematic when the person looks like they're underage. The minor in this instance was 6'4", uh, 20 years old, and looked older. So for whatever that's worth, we're, talk we're factoring in a lot of circumstances here. A busy night, an older looking person who's very tall, um, 
I also don't want you to think that Mr. Armstrong is the only uh, person who works in the store. He's the only employee, but that doesn't mean he's the only person that works in there. Uh, Mr. Patel and his wife spend 50 to 60 hours in that store a week, as well as Mr. Uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, he's got experience. He's uh, uh, he's been a CVS store manager for many, many years, and has checked IDs before, again, in relation to sales of cigarettes, not alcohol. But uh, I think we're dealing with responsible people here. Uh, they are taking some remedial steps. I want you to be aware of, so uh, they intend this incident not to recur. Uh, Mr. Armstrong just completed his tips training. He probably should have had that before he's behind the counter, but that's another matter. He uh, has completed his tips training. I think that's only going to assist him being able to check IDs more efficiently, more important to check them. Uh, they're hiring a fourth person to work in there, which I think is going to alleviate some of the problem with the rush that you had on July 3rd, which I think was a very unusual set of circumstances. And uh, Mr. Patel tells me tonight that he's going to be investing about four grand into what's called a check ID machine. I'm not sure that you're familiar with it, but it's, it's a lot of money to put in there. A lot of places don't have those because of the, it's cost prohibitive but apparently it's very effective in checking fake IDs, giving the age without having to look very closely at the, uh, at the numbers that are on there. So uh, I think we're dealing with serious people who are responsible. I don't think we, I, I, I wouldn't want you to take the word of one individual that this is a free-for-all. One other point, they've never seen, and I talked to them, uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, who saw the miner that night, he'd never seen him in the store before. Mr. Patel and his wife also checked the, the video. Never seen that minor in a store before. So while he says he was there, they have no recollection of that. So we'd be happy to answer any questions of myself or, or the two please. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason Mr. Armstrong did not receive tips training prior to being put on the job? Um, I wasn't, I didn't represent them at the time of their application, so my, my usual advice, I think, would, would be for them to have done that. And will the new clerk have had it before he or she begins? Absolutely. Or Surf Saver or Safe Surf or whatever, right. the equivalent of the alcohol training with it. Comments from the other end of the board, Jack? Yeah, I've got a couple questions. I'm, whether you were representing him or not at the time, I guess I would ask you, Mr. Patel, why was your employee not properly trained in accordance with the way that we ex have an expectation in this house? I'm trying to find out where to get it. And a couple of times we missed it. They were in meeting in somewhere else, in the Marlboro and everywhere else. And he worked for me like a part-time. Then he got in the full-time, in the beginning. And I didn't get it. Then the, we figured out we can do the online. We didn't know. Then I'll figure out uh, we can do the online. And we did it. So, can I comment? I was working both the CVS job uh, and Stone and Redstone, um, and I have to go through a lot of classes there for, for the licenses and IDs. So I was working only I was working full time there, and then coming to help Cal part time at night. We weren't sure how long I was going to stay there because I already had a manager's job. So it wasn't until um, January that of this year that I decided to go full time. So, no excuse why. I so from January to July 3rd, there wasn't one time where you could take the training that we prescribed which as conditional to the licenses that are that you're currently holding with us. Just so I, I mean that's that's a little bit mysterious to me. Um, yeah, another yeah. question that I do have, um, I, I wonder, you know, if a request has been made now several weeks ago by the local police department for a copy of the surveillance video that they, why that hasn't been produced? Mr. Charles, yeah, they, we, I talked to them about that and I asked whether or not that had been taken care of. And I'm, I'm probably maybe the least tech pers capable person in this room probably right now, but what I'm told is that they've had some difficulty with on a laptop and they're trying to transfer it over to something else. Cal, maybe you can explain the difficulty that you have. We did the USB and I told him if he, he, he knows, he can do it too. But he don't know either, so he didn't do it, and I tried to do it. But I put in the USB that comes out, and then I go to the laptop, I cannot. I, I think if my license was get it back, you know. I would find but somebody I that could do this professionally and do it yesterday. Uh, I, you know, I mean. I offered him if you know, he can do it too, you know. We both tried to do it, but somehow 
the, the John's getting it. There's a certain lack of urgency both in the events leading up, which is the tips training, and the events subsequent, which is the production of the video, that tend to undermine the argument about resolution of the problem. You know, I'd be all, I'd be all over that because my business, continuing business, is at risk. My reputation is at risk, and my representations to being interested in solving the problem in some way are colored by the speed and completeness of my response. It, it just doesn't, on the surface, look like it's a big deal. Any other questions from members of the board? Marcy? Uh, I'm curious to know if, um, if you and your wife also have had TIPS training. If yes. you're working there. So you've both taken TIPS training. Both. And I heard you say that the other person that you're hiring would have TIPS training or something else. Is, right. is that acceptable for more? Standards that I, I've heard people talk about tips. I haven't heard about the other programs. Is that an acceptable, yeah, reasonable? I, I would say that it absolutely has to happen before the person starts working, before they start working. But I agree, there's a, a lack of urgency, it seems, in things. Yeah, there's two parts to problem resolution containment and correction. It's been contained, but I don't see the correction. And this is July 3rd. Well, since since um, he has taken the training, so they're, they are taking steps. I think it's a yeah. just a technical issue with that. We, in fact, we're not questioning. The, the police already have seen the tapes. They came down and they viewed them. Sure. So they've seen them all already. They've seen what they want to see. Um, we'd be happy to provide back tapes if we have them to, to address your other concerns. But uh, I, I understand the point. It's a, I, I, in talking to them, I can tell you it's, it's not a lack of urgency. They're very concerned about this. The, uh, the as you know, Reading has a tremendous focus on substance abuse, starting at the earliest levels in our schools and uh, continuing, hopefully, with lessons that are followed through life. The single largest abuse drug, at least when I was a teenager, was alcohol. I don't know that it's changed. I think the popularity of other alternatives has only grown. And we take a really dim view of it because it sends a message to the kids as to how serious the adults are. Um, we have the latitude to impose a um, cessation of business, a delay of business for some number of days. Up to including revocation. Um, and what strikes me in this case, if the comments of the individual are to be believed, is that this was not his first visit to the facility that he didn't even live in Reading, which implies he had to have been told. But that's, that's an implication that he wouldn't have known by living in the town. Um, and so this reputation or this knowledge had apparently become known to him other than being a resident of the town. Uh, to me, that's an aggravating circumstance in that we're all busy. I'm busy in my world. And tonight, I you quote a chapter and verse in my Able to town council has corrected me. We, we all make mistakes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going with that down, am I? <laughs> I take, take mistakes seriously. Um, and you're not the first to have failed a compliance check. What's, uh, what's aggravating in this circumstance to me is it's not a compliance check issued by the town of Reading. It's an individual saying, yeah, I did it, and I've done it before and I live in Medford or I live in Wakefield. So the implications are it's a, not a one-off, but it's the first discovery of what might be considered a trend or a pattern. And to me, that, that's an aggravating factor in my assessment. Mr. Andrew, we're, we're really putting a lot of faith and stock in a young individual's word and statement under a very stressful situation. There's no other evidence other than that statement. Well, I, mean, I, would, I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't. I consider the totality of the situation, and in fact, I've had it at the same time. You're citing circumstantial things that tend to. Yeah, well. and I think that's where I'm coming from. I understand that, you know, uh, if I'm 20 years old and I'm being questioned by a police officer and I know I'm in trouble, yeah, yeah okay, I'm liable to say whatever I'm liable to say. I get that. However, what Mr. Arena has pointed out is very interesting. First of all, there's, there's an anonymous tip that comes in that has some basis because you know when the detective decides to 
you know, in a fairly short order, take a just a, a look and see what's going on. He immediately sees this happening. It kind of corroborates the fact that there's uh, there's a there's a tip that comes in, and the fact that we've got out of town kids that show up. I mean, they show up for a reason. They didn't select this place because it had the best sale going on. I guarantee you that. Um, and the circumstantial issues here are not small. Um, and you know, I mean, there's a series of things here that cause me great concern. A six month delay and then, you know, and then a violation is what causes the tips training to be engaged for this employee. Unacceptable. Um, cooperation with the police and trying to understand, you know, exactly what happened by being able to take the documentation that they viewed with you and have it in their hands for their use in the prosecution of this case. I, again, three weeks goes by, and nothing happens, and the, I mean, and I'm hearing that, you know, the owner is prepared to spend four thousand dollars for an ID checker, but. <laughs> you know, is not willing to get an IT person to come in and download a surveillance tape to provide to the, to the local police. Uh, cooperation with the local police is really important as far as I'm concerned as one of the people that looks at these licenses being issued. And frankly, uh, you know, it's a bit insulting to hear that on July 3rd this happened and because it's a busy night in the liquor store, that's okay. That causes me great concern. An explanation, not an excuse, Mr. Palsy. I understand. But even tonight, your comments about being 6'4", I got carded at Chili's. No, there's no doubt I'm not under the age of 20. And they do that, I think, to force compliance on the part of the employee to remove any judgment. So you even cite that tonight as a contributing factor. That's exactly why the carding is not subjective. It's objective. You do it all the time. Un un there maybe are some extreme circumstances, but uh, Chief, you said in your opening <coughs> remarks that there were tips plural. Was there more than one tip provided? Yes. Do you have the background on the dates or the? Um, I'm not sure. How many did we get on the text thing? Do you remember? I, I know. I know. I received one verbally uh, from a person in town, um, probably about a week before the text to tip uh, tip had come in. So there's two that you can. Two that I How know. long was that one prior two, to the violation? I'm sorry. How long was the text to tip before uh, the violation? Sounds like a week. I believe about a week. A week. Okay. So just just tonight from the police, we've got two independent, unrelated references, and a third discovery. That's not an accident. You'd have to be incredibly unlucky to have three reports in a short interval of time and have those be the only instances that that that's beyond the law of chance that is a trend and that's what i meant by an aggravating circumstance um, any other comments from the members of the board Kevin? you know one of the only comments I'd, that i'd make well actually i had one quick question uh, for the detective um you were able to review the tapes of that evening on yes. uh, july 3rd but you, you didn't look backwards to see to corroborate that he said he'd been doing it for about a month no okay and that's what they were having difficult difficulty with with the um, surveillance tapes. It took us a while just to narrow it down July third, and the okay. the times were off, so it, it took a while just to get what I needed that day. Okay, I mean that's to me that would be some interesting information to have to see to 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 as you say to corroborate whether he was saying that just to get himself off the hook or if he was actually um, out there doing it and, and had done it several times. The, the other interesting thing, um, as I'm looking over some past violations in town, not with you, of course, that we understand this is your first time, um, there, there certainly continues to be a little bit of a trend in, in violations um, around town. And it's, it's the troubling thing to me is the signals keep getting thrown out there that this is absolutely not going to be accepted, but it continues to happen. Um, that troubles me just, just personally. It has nothing to do... Uh, with you, it's just the, the trend from the past as well. Um, but I, I would be interested to certainly to have been able to corroborate whether this um, individual was actually telling the truth about more instances than just the one that they got caught for. Marcy? 
have to say, I, I, I find it, I, I would be surprised if I, if I were in a situation such as this and I was being questioned by the police, I would only say that it was the first time I had been there. I did not volunteer. I had been there more than one time. It seems, it seems counterintuitive to me that that would be something they would throw out. But Either way, I think that the, the situation is there's no, been no training, there's been two anonymous tips, there's been one person caught, and I think just going with that, um, you know, it, it, um, it's definitely a troubling situation. So. Jeff? I have a last question. Um, how long is your license to sell alcohol been valid and right? This was June. June 20th. It was just for him. So it's. So it's about, it's about a year, a little over a year, about 13 months. Any other comments from Ricky's Liquors or Council? Bob, uh, what's the recourse here? You have in your policy as a first offense, which this is, uh, from a, a verbal warning, if you will, to a three day suspension. That's your latitude. That's been our policy, but mm -hmm. that's not, we're not limited in that. You are limited. That's we are, what the well, policy Well, I guess technically. <laughs> you like the so word? You like the word? No. <laughs> policies are policies. It, until they're well, the policy says the penalties listed in, in the policy are only a guide. Yeah. A licensing authority may use its discretion in determining whether the facts surrounding a violation warrant a penalty which is more lenient or severe than, the, than that suggested by the guidelines. This is the history. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's right. Yeah, there's not a history. Right. Um, Are ready to close? Yeah. Um, I'm going to move that the Board of Select and close the hearing on the possible modifications. Hang on, hang on, Dan. Sorry. Procedurally, we close the hearing before we... Before we ask for them. Thank you. Uh, she, you have to ask a public comment, comment on this? Any final yeah. comments? Before you yeah. yeah. comment? sure if they have anything else. Yeah, I asked. I don't mean to cut you off. Else that you'd like but any, but of anybody. Of anybody, right. Any public comment. Yeah, that's true. Right with the Board of Selectmen, uh, close the hearing on the possible modification, suspension, or revocation of the retail package store license to expose, keep for sale, and to sell all kinds of alcoholic beverages for Jay and Ricky Inc., DBA Ricky's Liquor, 214 Main Street for violating MGL Chapter 138, Section 34, for the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 years of age. Okay. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Move the Board of Selectmen find J and Ricky Inc. DBA Ricky's Liquor 214 Main Street Reading in violation of MGL Chapter 138 Section 34 for the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 years of age on July 3rd, 2014. Right, second. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Now, the discussion. Uh, to entertain a sense of the board first. Uh, yeah. What were people's, people's heads up? I'll volunteer an opinion just to, just to size it. What's, what, are the, what are the contributing circumstances here? There's at least three mm -hmm. reference points that are unrelated, right. uh, independent, and I can't speak if they're factual, right. but if they're not, it's a really unfortunate circumstance. Well, one of them's factual. Yeah. One, one is factual. Okay. Mitigating the owner has a clean record with his other business yeah. and up to this point with this business. But I go back to those three indicated being a trend and not an isolated event, mm -hmm. which right. is normally what you would conclude with a compliance check because mm -hmm. there are no complaints and it's our attempt to force the question. I'm inclined to do something greater than a, what we would normally do for a first offense under those circumstances. I would also. Yeah. What's the rest of the board? I'm thinking five days. My inclination would be 34 days, which is just about Four. the minimum, because it, I, I do think that it, it probably qualifies for that. Um, and then I would say that we probably would request that perhaps there are some compliance checks done along the way um, so that we can kind of keep up on this, because I think it needs to be taken very seriously. And I think we need to have some very clear yeah. indication that that's happening. Kevin? Yeah, I was, I was tossing up. Um, between the three and the five days. 
I will uh, say the folks you see on here who've had five days had two prior uh, that's, violations that's, that I, were, yeah, that's you know, the only so, so I, I, th I'm, I just think we need to not jump too far ahead in terms of, um, you know, yes, but, sorry. No, that's I, I jumped in. Anything else? Four is in the middle of that range. Um, <laughs> yeah, four is in the middle of that range. I, I would be fine with four days. Okay. All right, four. Yeah. Um, this, this is very troubling to me. This is a very troubling set of circumstances. Um, I've been present in this room when a number of these other um, local businesses have been found in violation and penalized. Um, and those circumstances were a violation is a violation. They seem the circumstances seem to be somewhat different mm -hmm. here uh, than they were in the others. Um, frankly, I, I will just say out loud uh, the fact that it's a whole over a year has gone by without a compliance check is a problem. <laughs> um, you know, and I just say that because I, I wish that we did that more often. I think it's a really important part of our substance program here in town. And, um, and so, you know, the fact that there has not been a compliance check here, you know, um, I mean, it just causes me, it causes me some problems. And I, and I will tell you, I mean, I think that there are some other mitigating circumstances here that, that also trouble me, that we spend this long without TIPS training, which is, we're very clear about, you know, when we issue licenses here what the expectation is, and that's been ignored. Um, you know, our, poli our local police department asks for some assistance um, in the prosecution of a crime, and we get, you know, kind of a half-hearted, you know, um, support for them. That causes me a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I do realize that we have to look at policy to a certain extent. Um, I know mm -hmm. we're not bound by the policy, but I think you know, it's reasonable. I think, Marcy, you do make a good point that, um, you know, the, the only five-day suspension in recent, uh, actually in 10 years, is tied mm -hmm. to, you know, a company that had a total of three violations. So it probably, in, in keeping with a sense of fairness, you know, maybe four is the right, I mean, it's it steps up over, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the minimum, and, and, and I hope sends a message, because I, I will tell you this, if I'm on this board and there's another violation, I'm going to vote to suspend your license permanently. That would be my position. Uh, this, is, this is serious business in my mind. We've got a substance problem in this town. It starts with alcohol. We've got many licenses issued here. And this is, this is to be taken seriously. And in my mind, um, I would, I would vote for four days, um, and I would be, and I just will say, pointed uh, that if I was to see this business in here again, uh, it would be my recommendation to suspend and revoke their license. However, given that this is actually a first offense, um, I would, I would vote in favor of the four-day suspension. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm okay with four. Uh, Need the motion? Uh, I'd like to, well, let's do that first. Move that Jane Rickey Incorporated DBA Rickey's Liquor, 214 Main Street, Reading, be penalized with a four day suspension for violation of MGL Chapter 138, Section 34 for the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 years of age on July 3rd, 2014. Do I have a second? Second. Marcy seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Five zero. Um, you might want to ask if they have. Yeah. Is there is there a uh, when would you propose to serve that four day suspension? Is there a date you have in mind? I prefer it would be uh, September 15, 16, 17, and eighteen consecutive. Sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. Okay. And Bob, could you go over the procedure for surrendering the license? That's uh, what's the it's day the of the 19th. week on the fifteenth? It's a Monday. Okay. Um, you would need to surrender the license to the town manager's office generally either fall or right before 9 o'clock on the 15th. 
and then come and pick it up on the day you're eligible to be restated, which would be a little tricky. We might have to arrange it with the police department if it's Friday. Did, did they have to post some signage that they're suspended? And there will be some signage. That so they're, they're to told this whole drill. Be in touch with you. It's in the motion. So. Okay, got it. So to pick up the license rather than going to town hall since we're closed on Friday, we'll probably send you to the police department. And that would be a, what, approximately 9 o'clock on that morning. That would be Friday morning. Is there a motion there? Sure. Move the four day suspension for Jay and Ricky Incorporated, DBA Ricky's Liquor, 214 Main Street, Reading, take place on September 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, 2014. That the license be surrendered to the office of the town manager no later than 9 a.m. the first day of the suspension, to be returned to the licensee by 9 a.m. the first day following the suspension, and that a placard be paid, placed on the premises during the period of the suspension indicating the business is unable to sell liquor due to a suspension of the liquor license for sale of liquor to an underage person, and that Jane Ricky Inc. reimburse the town of running for constable and advertising fees, and this decision, including the designation of the dates of suspension, was rendered on the basis of Kalpesh Patel's waiver of appeal. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Kevin Sexton will second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor? 5-0. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, it doesn't bring us any joy to do this, believe me. We welcome business into the town, and uh, it's with a, with a sense of regret that we have to do this, but it's what's what's dictated. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Detective. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. What we have at this point is the continuation of a hearing for a proposed four-way stop sign at the intersection of Sunnyside and Fairview. The proponent of the proposed four-way stop, I understand, is not av available this evening. Correct. And since the original hearing, several of our members, I think, have gone and we'll good night, Ray. Good night. Good night. Uh, good night. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well. <laughs> Several of our members have personally visited. I, unfortunately, I was not able to make it, but one of our members was kind enough to take some. I came that way this evening. <laughs> 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 On my way here. <laughs> I got um, snaps. So maybe just briefly go around the room for those who did visit and their observations. Um, yeah, I visited the, after the last hearing because I'd heard that they had done some um, Bush trimming at mm -hmm. the time. So I think I visited maybe about uh, four or five days after that. And to my surprise, when I got in there, the bush trimming was a bush removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it is a trimming. <laughs> <laughs> it was originally trimmed and then it was removed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I sat pretty far back behind the stop line um, as you were traveling. It's the ones that are uh, yeah. What's yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the two streets? Uh, yeah. Fairview. As you were traveling Fairview down Fairview to Sunnyside. Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. and, and you really, the sight line oh, at that so point, I can imagine with the bush was tough, but the sight line really um, was a non issue. Once this bush was removed, do you know which corner this is? Fairview that, West. That's Mount. facing towards. That's um, that's looking south on Sunnyside, where so the cones are. Cones are on Sunnyside, looking south. Yeah. And that's and that's, uh, that's the direction. opposite. So there were bushes. This at is that's that the, where the, where I was just referencing. That, that's okay. heading, where I was stopped well before the stop. That's heading eastbound down. on Fairview, looking at the right turn on mm -hmm. the Sunnyside. Right. And right. I believe the point of contention was those bushes where you see the ground. Right there. Yeah. But that has really opened up the sight line, so anybody coming up to that stop can clearly see traffic. Well yeah. down, you can almost see the next street sign on Sunday In fact, side. as I was coming to the intersection, there was a pedestrian who was over where the would have been behind the bushes, mm -hmm. passing through. It was very easy to see them yeah. coming. Right. I, I no, took pictures no. the other way, too, and it's, it was always clear that way. Did, did anybody get a sense from the um, person who brought this forward that they actually are now okay? He just said he was unable to attend tonight. He didn't make any other comments. For those who might forget, he wasn't able to attend the, the original hearing that opened this question. Right. So and you delayed it so that he could For that be purpose. Here. Right. So. Correct. And uh, uh, two, two thoughts from myself. One is I think the issue has been mitigated to my satisfaction. Yeah. And my reason to have continued the meeting at first is while we're governed by practice and policy, circumstances on the ground mm -hmm. always have to apply and be taken into consideration. and these warranted doing so. I think they've been since mitigated, so I'd be inclined to close the hearing and 
wait and see if the applicant wants to. Any so, is that the sense of the board? Sure. Yeah. All right. Why don't you read? Let's, is there anybody here who has yeah. public is there, comment? Well, we have the hearing open. Uh, any comments? These folks are all tuckered out of that uh, <laughs> <laughs> historical commission session. Okay. All right, hearing none. Move that the Board of Selectmen close the hearing on the proposed four-way stop at Sunnyside and Fairview Avenue. Uh, second that. Okay. All those in favor? 5-0. I right. intend to make no further motion. Correct. Some other board member won't sorry. And Bob, you have a presentation on uh, complete streets. Jesse does. Start with Jesse Wilson. So before you tonight, we have the final draft of the bike and ped plan that we've been working on for the past year, as well as a final draft complete streets policy. Uh, we do have MAPC here. They're going to do the presentation and we'll uh, be able to answer any questions that you have. I also have, in case you don't have, um, a couple copies of the plan and the complete streets policy. So those are available if you want to look at them. So with that, I'm going to let Chris uh, do the presentation. And I think we have a clicker. Actually, if you need to click this, we are. I've got it on my screen. Yeah, it's what we have in the packet. Yeah, it's what we have on our screen. Yeah, you can either sit here or. Thanks for Hello. having me back again. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm also here with my colleague Sarah. Um, so at the end, we can well, let's hopefully answer some questions that you have. Um, so I'm sorry, you are Chris. I'm Chris. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is cover sort of the two parts that, I, that we've introduced before. There's the policy side that sort of sets the vision, and then the plan that gets into sort of our recommendations on the pedestrian um, as well as the bicycle network. So we can start with the complete street side as a reminder of sort of just what the definition of what a complete street is. So this very general, simple definition, it's uh, a complete street is one that is safe, it's comfortable, it's accessible for all users, uh, sort of emphasizing, so when we say all users, the needs of children, the needs of the elderly, the needs of the disabled population, um, and for multiple modes of travel. So in addition to cars, and I sort of emphasize it's not sort of taking away cars, um, but in addition, sort of what can make things safer for people who are walking, who are biking, people taking the bus, so people accessing the, uh, the commuter rail stop. So we've had, in a little bit less than a year now, we've had a bunch of communities that have adopted these local policies. Um, last August, there was no one. Right now, um, as you can see, there's a strong handful the one update from this presentation is as of last night, Acton's Board of Selectmen voted to adopt um, the Complete Streets policy that we've been working on, which is it's very similar to the ones um, you have um, for this town as well. Um, and so we're continuing to work currently with Danvers, Beverly, and Middleton, which should all be happening, um, hopefully going up for adoption within the next um, couple months. And then there's a couple other communities as well that we're a little bit sort of earlier on in the process with. So in terms of what the policy is, um, I think sort of a few highlights. Um, one of the important things, especially in the town of Reading, is really you're already doing a lot of this stuff, especially with the pedestrian side, but also with the bicycle side. And so this sort of this policy really, it sort of codifies what's already happening in a lot of um, many respects. Um, it's so if, for example, if let's say the town engineer leaves, so when the new town engineer comes, he sort of knows like what the, um, the town sort of vision and, and prerogative is with relation to these um, types of initiatives. So it says this general vision has the town sort of consider complete streets, given sort of the other constraints that might exist, whether it's something sort of just practical, like, well, you have such a narrow right of way that you couldn't put a sidewalk in here even if you wanted to, um, as well as sort of financial considerations. If it's just too expensive, then um, that's another example of what would sort of be uh, an exception. Um, the policy contains a number of resources to refer to. Some are sort of very design specific about what best practices are. Some of one of the resources is the bike plan, so that the town sort of knows like to refer to the bike plan when thinking about uh, prioritizing bicycle or uh, pedestrian amenities. It's intended to create sort of this overall sort of incremental change. So it's not meant to flip the switch and start tomorrow that everything's going to change. Um, it's just over time, um, additional sort of improvements to the town we made. 
Um, and again, that, like I said, it allows for exceptions, and then finally it sort of sets the town up for this um, complete street certification legislation um, if that funding becomes available, which I talked about last time, and I'll uh, refresh your memory in a minute about that. Uh, it's not <coughs> intended to be sort of a specific design prescription, so every case is different on every road, and so it takes that into account. Like I said, it's, it's just more of a general vision, um, so in that respect, it's not a requirement for a specific type or any bicycle or pedestrian facility on every single road. Um, we also realize that the primary purpose of a road is to get from point A to point B, and so and this isn't intended to sort of replace that. It's sort of just an additional thing that, again, if there's the room to, to put a sidewalk or if sidewalks need repairing, to sort of consider that when you're doing roadway reconstruction. So I put here, this is an ex um, sort of a way that I, sort of, I think the policy is intended to work. Um, this sort of, I broke it into three general types of projects that might occur. One type is sort of your routine project. So this is when you're um, like just doing a simple repaving and you're going to restripe it. Um, so the way the process would work for these types of projects, it's very similar to the way things go now. The town engineer, along with the PTTF. Um, did I get a T there? I think so. <laughs> I realize that as I wrote that. Um, they would get together, talk about the street, look at the sort, um, the, the bike plan, et cetera, and as well as the other resources, and see if there are opportunities, um, again, given constraints, to include some of these recommendations that would be sort of best practices for complete streets elements. Um, and then either they would include them as appropriate, or they would sort of exempt it because it's, for whatever reason, it's not um, a possibility, at least at this time. Kind of moving over to sort of a larger project, so these are things that might be sort of uh, like an intersection redesign. Um, here, the PTTF TF would work in con I'm going to stop saying that acronym. Um, would work in conjunction with the appropriate parties, whether it's MassDOT or whomever, a developer, etc. Um, make sort of the recommendations, um, and at that point, it, it would come in front of if there were, um, let's say, exceptions that were requested. It would come to the board of selectmen um, or a designee of the board of selectmen to. Um, determine whether an exception is, is valid. For other projects, so it's just things that would come, so for example, subdivisions, or if something's coming under site plan review, those regulations exist, and those obviously would supersede this um, as a policy. And so one of the um, sort of implementation steps of the PTTTF is to um, look at these regulations. I think Can I you just one. explain what that is? Because you know, the PTTF is what? <laughs> that is the Parking Traffic Transportation Task Force, yeah. um, which contains members of the safety Staff officers, um, town engineer, okay. among Thank others. You. Sorry. <laughs> we might rename In it, keeping with <laughs> I'm always forgetting to use it. just call it the <laughs> <laughs> and so, so this group would sort of look at these regulations um, when things come up when they have time, make sort of recommendations about ways that they could be updated in order to include complete streets elements. Um, just a simple example might be, um, I don't know what the subdivision regulations look like, but maybe to say, well, maybe you should require um, sidewalks on all cul-de-sacs, etc. Um, and so then, if they are up, if they're updated, then the town or the developers would follow those rules um, as when they are updated. So the Complete Street State legislation, this is a certification program that's 50, authorized for $50 million over the next five years, $10 million a year to provide certified communities with funding for planning and implementation of these types of elements. Um, right now it was included in the Transportation Bond Bill, which the governor signed off on. Um, MassDOT and the governor has not made a final decision on what's happening with the money, if they want to release part of it, some of it, any of it. MEPC is continuing to sort of advocate, obviously, for this. Um, I think so. The point: if you have the policy, that's one of the cr main criteria, and so it sort of just already puts you ahead of the game. That when, if when this um, money is released, you know, um, being able to access. When was it authorized? Um, it was signed. Just recently. Yeah, maybe within July. the last couple of months. Yeah. So that's the policy side, so switching gears a little bit to the bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, so this is sort of building upon a lot of the work that the town has already been doing from previous studies to um, the actual implementation of the redesign of the downtown area as well as the inclusion of the bicycling on Haverhill Street. And so what MAPC, Sarah and I, and um, our colleagues did, we looked at sort of creating, the purpose was to create sort of a network over time of 
bicycle facilities that are on the road, as well as looking at some potential off-road connections that could be um, created um, over the longer term within the community. And then looking at some specific areas to sort of really drill down from the pedestrian side ways to sort of improve the pedestrian experience and the safety of pedestrians. Those areas were really looking at mainly schools as well as a little downtown a little bit because but it's already been recently done. Uh, looking at um, Walker's Brook Road um, and a few other areas as well that the town sort of decided were sort of the high priority areas. Um, in terms of the process, I think the main takeaway is we, we began this last fall. Um, we've done extensive outreach. I believe many of some of the stakeholders that we've um, spoken to are here in the room tonight. Um, and so this was really intended to be sort of an iterative process where we came up with sort of plans where we didn't do things in a vacuum but really took into account the town's um, in, in, um, input. So from the bicycle side, we looked, the recommendations are mainly um, looking for opportunities where you can include bicycle lanes, or in some cases, um, shared lane markings or signs. Um, there were approximately the potential for eight and, eight and a half um, miles of bicycle lanes within the town, just within today's existing roadway width that could be included um, throughout the network. Um, and then we provided sort of an allocation of how we would see sort of the travel lanes, parking lanes, bicycle lanes, et cetera, for all these roadway segments which is all included in the report. Uh, so an example, this is on West Street. So it's 31 and a half feet. And you can see that there's shoulders and there's um, the travel lanes are 12 feet and 13 feet, at least at this segment. And so the way that the, the plan would look is when these areas are repaved and restriped without changing the curve to curve, it's just simply reallocating where the, the paint falls. And so there's the space to have 11 foot lanes um, or a 10 and a half foot lane and then five foot bicycle lanes. And there's some um, flexibility within that as well. That's sort of ideal as a five foot bike lane, but uh, I believe you can go down as now as four feet to still be a bicycle lane. So there's, there's some flexibility there. So just a quick question. Mm -hmm. When they get to the paving phase of West Street, will they be showing this as their 25% design? Is that the going in design? They're gonna look, make it look this I way. don't know if they've actually decided, yeah. but that's, okay. that, would, that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe where this is a state project, um, we can ask, but we mm -hmm. can't. Mandate. Insist. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and just just as somewhat of an aside, but it's on this part of the point. The department had to met with Senator Lewis a couple of months ago and just asked him, you know, what are the interesting things you have to say? This is one of the first things he said was mm -hmm. adopt a complete streets policy because uh, you know I don't care whether you like it or not. Yeah. But if you like it, there's lots of money right now. Five years from now, there won't be because mm -hmm. no one's in now. So they're looking to give money away, assuming it all gets approved, it goes that way. Um, I asked them if it would apply to something like this, because there's a local share, sure. and I, the answer is I doubt it. <laughs> doesn't mean that this can't be designed this way, but I doubt it's going to replace our obligation on that project, because it's already too far along. But it is absolutely available for future. And in practice, if you had a project where you wanted to apply it, that funding, you'd have to segregate out the fraction of the project that is that scope of work, the striping only, for example. I'm not sure you do. I, I think it's just here's you know X amount of dollars as part of your project. Oh, uh, you know we like the fact you're doing that. Aspect. Okay. Is this in reference to the certification part in terms of the money? Yeah. 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 And then there's the certification has some sort of measures that they want you to sort of somehow track your progress mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. that you What's your? I'm going to get to this in a minute. I was in Somerville over the weekend doing some uh, picking up some material. And the, the streets were laid out so that it was the curb on street parking and a bike lane to the left, adjacent to what would yeah. be the driver's door. And having never been in that situation before, I almost collided with a bike rider that was coming over my left shoulder. So I looked, oncoming traffic, no, I didn't even see the bi bike rider because mm -hmm. you don't expect to see them. It's kind of what motorcyclists complain about, except we're all familiar with motorcyclists. Mm -hmm. And uh, to what degree does it take to retrain or do you have ex is there experience when you've employed these things where it takes some amount of uh, exposure or retraining for the population? This, or? Sure, yeah, throughout the process, we've definitely stated that education is a huge part of it. There's, I think, a lot of training that we've been pushing for with the RMV, just about um, how to put on your, your seatbelt when you unplug your seatbelt, that you look over your shoulder when you get out of the car to avoid drawing people. Um, it is a process, but definitely, at least for <coughs> For us, you know, working in Boston with the network that got, that has gone in, like the first bike lane that went in, nobody really knew what it was or 
what it meant and share lanes as well, like the little you know figures on the road, people didn't know what they were. And it's just kind of one of those things, the more you see it, the more you get used to it and, and people get educated that way. But we would definitely recommend an education process um, here in the town as part of it as well. Thank you. Can I just ask a sure. question? Uh, Chief, do you have any issues on Haverhill? Does that situation exist on a small part of Haverhill? Yeah, no, no, we have no, 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 no issues. Okay. No, it's working all fine. Oh, and sorry, one other note. A lot of the areas that we um, found that bike lanes could fit in the existing curb layout or roadway layout um, are areas that do not have parking currently, like, like Haverhill Street. Right. So not every, mm -hmm. you know, all of these eight and a half miles um, are areas right adjacent to um, to a parking lane. Actually, I think very few of them are. Yep. So. Yep. So I'll show a zoomed in version. This is sort of the town wide view of what the, the plan sort of looks like. But it's this sense the idea is that the, the blue dashed lines are the proposed bicycle lanes of mm -hmm. where what could fit today, um, except with a couple exceptions on Main Street, which I'll explain. Um, and then connecting that are some areas where, because the bicycle, there's not enough width for bicycle lanes, so that's where you would have to either put the shared lane markings, as Eric I was just talking about, um, or signs um, for those sort of to make those connections. The red areas that are circled are areas that are sort of some challenging intersections that it should be looked at further in terms of making sure that they're um, when the, they're Speaking of challenges, one of the things that was in Somerville was this, the big rotary by um, traps. Yeah, There's all bike lanes in it. It's so the most confusing. <laughs> How would you do, would you propose to do the 128 rotary? Um, where, where 129 goes into Wakefield. Yeah. You have two circles there. Is that what you're proposing? Yes. Oh, so. So. We have um, put some recommendations. For re just general that those should be looked at for safety. We haven't uh, put in detailed recommendations for redesigning it. Um, I live near the Shrafts building, and it's extremely um, dangerous and challenging. But luckily, they're planning on getting rid of that rotary once they get the money to um, redesign it. Are they going to put it in the overpass again? The no, they're actually going to make it a grid, uh, more of a grid hmm. street path. The and they're going to use the, the resulting process to actually test the yeah. development. But <laughs> it's a <laughs> <no> story that. <laughs> So zooming in, um, as you can see, uh, <coughs> there exists right now um, on Haverhill Street, the bicycle lane. Yeah. Currently to the north part of that, there's uh, right now there's some signs that say to share the road. Right. Based upon our measurements, we think that it's still within Mass Dot's guidance, that mm -hmm. you could still fit travel lanes with bicycle lanes, so that's that was our recommendation, but there is at least something right now. Um, and you can see the, I forget what street it is, um, point here. Right that it was sort of a lot of um, the residents wanted to some sort of connection, but there's not the right way to make a bicycle lane. So this is the type of situation where the town could put up signs just to sort of alert the drivers or, or possibly arm shared lane markings um, in these areas. On Main Street, there has been some discussion about potentially having a lane diet, so where it's four lanes going down to maybe three lanes or something, um, up, depending upon what the, um, the analysis finds. If something like that happens, then the, the resulting space would have enough room for bicycle lanes, and so this plan just reflects that, that if that happens, you can do bicycle lanes. This is on North Main Street? Yeah. Yes, yes, this the is the would be on is, is, is there any kind of a philosophy that, you no, know... No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying oh. that there'll be a diet there, too. Could, there, too. I, I mean, if if potential. If you want. That, that's yeah. a, like a secondary phase, I think. Yeah, it's mostly south. It would be south between Hopkins and... Uh, the track. So the plan isn't recommending they say if that right. happens, right. then you'll have the room to do the bike lanes. Is there any sense that if you have alternate routes like Caverhill and West, which provides, in my opinion, a much safer venue for biking, that you fully employ those with the bike lanes? Yeah. Dedicate those as bikes. As opposed to restricting traffic on Main Street. I mean, I'm not trying to be misunderstood here. I, I'm forgetting the bikers to where they need to go, but I'm for their safety too. Sure, but I thought think, of them um, biking on Main I mean, Street. Some bikers yeah. will want to take the most direct route, and so if without a doubt, yeah. and, and again, this this is all assuming that you are going to have a lot of extra space if yeah. that something happens. That if that is the case, um, I don't think it would be any different on Main Street versus Main Street. Um, like so does this reflect the different? We have a change in traffic pattern at that end of town with a different lane usage. Yeah, and when man. this study started, that is very recent. It's mm -hmm. not 60 days old. Main, Main and Franklin. Yeah, Main and Franklin is. That's now got a dedicated turn lane. Of like a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I, I don't think that's reflected up there in the consideration of a North Main Street diet. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we're not 
doing the die or doing that analysis. Yeah. So this is just all yeah. based upon if something does happen. Um, and so this is just those uh, these are the streets on the north side that could potentially include the bicycle lanes. So then moving to the south side again, as you can see, there's actually in some ways more opportunity. Um, there's only a few locations where shared lane markings or the signs would be required in order to sort of create the connection, so um, people could um, actually be on a separate bike lane throughout to get to most areas of the town within um, the southern portion. Um, the exception is on West Street, as you can see, there's, there is a section where the right of was constrained, so there would need to be some alternative there. And again, this reflects on Main Street, on South Main Street, um, <coughs> where the lane diet occurs, there would be a resulting space to include bicycle lanes. And this is the list of those bicycle lanes. So transitioning to the pedestrian side then, um, so again, as I mentioned, we've sort of prioritized access to the schools, the transit, the retail areas, as well as Walker's Park Drive. Really looking at the sidewalks, the conditions of those, the crosswalks, um, various ADA compliance elements, such as if there's a, a curb cut from a crosswalk, so that if you're in a wheelchair, you could actually get onto the sidewalk after crossing the street. So we did that, and then the other thing was looking at where there are gaps in the sidewalk, um, whether you're, where you're missing sidewalks, and then just prioritizing a little bit what, where maybe investments in the future could be made for um, filling in those sidewalks. These photos just show some of those examples that we were speaking about. For example, top right shows that you have a crosswalk, but then there's no curb cut, so you can't actually, if you were, were disabled, sure. you might not be able to actually get onto it. Um, there's uh, numerous instances where there are crosswalks, but they're very difficult to see. Um, so the guidance that we have um, in the policy shows some of there are different types of crosswalks, and so um, some styles are more highly visible, and so this is an example of where that might be more important. Looked at areas where the um, sidewalks are cracked, and so again, it's almost creating a punch list for the um, DPW and the town engineer as they move forward to um, make improvements. On the sidewalk cover side, I know it's a little blurry to see. What this essentially shows is three things. The sort of pink lines throughout are areas where there are no sidewalks, but there are sort of minor roads. They're called local roads as they're classified. The dark red ones are main roads. Um, so MassDOT classifies roads as arterials, collectors, et cetera. So that's those roads. Um, and then based upon sort of the input from the town and et cetera, the yellow highlights are the several areas where we think that the, the town should prioritize um, putting in sidewalks and then those are around the, the other rotary. Typically there are parts of the rotary um, by Salem Street that have the sidewalk, but some parts are missing. Um, Grove Street and Hawkins Street. Could you go back to that for a minute? So, did you mention Pearl Street as well? Uh, I did not mention Pearl oh, Street. I, no, I, I thought I misunderstood what you said. I'm sorry. I, I think Pearl Street it does not have sidewalks, no sidewalk. but no, there's, there's no, no right of way, mm -hmm. so it was not really a high priority because there's the lack of right of way. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's very narrow. Yeah. It's not, not really. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's tough enough to drive it. Anything else into it? There are parts of it with, down by my way with uh, sidewalks, but it, it's not universal. So here we just put, these, these are all in the report, but just some of the next steps is trying to sort of build a culture or continuing to build the culture of incorporating bicycle facilities as a matter of routine, putting, prioritizing the sidewalks proactively, seeking out the additional funding sources, working with the adjacent communities, for example, in Wakefield to think about ways to connect to the, to the lake, um, working with the community partners, and then um, just continuing to do these initiatives that promote uh, walking and bicycling. So with that, if there are any additional questions, Sarah or I can answer them. What, um, Back up a slide, please. You know, again, my little trip to Somerville was instructive. I've never seen so many other alternative lanes. To what degree is there discretion, rather than making it routine as part of policy, that you know, Reading's a relatively old town, some of the streets don't really comply, not, not all of them are necessarily straight. So there's some discretion either or driven by pattern, driven by priorities. Mm -hmm. My reading of the smart streets seem to describe that you set up the policy and then it's it's executed, but there isn't, once the policy's in place, it's kind of on, on its own, if you will. Uh, I'm not sure who the following. The, the, um, the notes we got in preparation of this meeting describe some of the, uh, for example, the next steps, incorporate bicycle facilities as a matter of routine. Okay. 
what may be appropriate in one street isn't appropriate in another based on either this board or whoever's assessed with it. What I would be really struggling with is if this became prioritized bicycle facilities uh, everywhere that's possible. Well, everywhere it's possible may not be everywhere that it's necessary or desired. That's what I'm getting at is sure. to what degree can you apply? I think the, the policy was intentionally written that it's you're going to look at it and actually think about it, thinking about it, but it doesn't mean you're going to put the bicycle facilities everywhere. Um, or the pedestrian facilities everywhere. And that's uh, subject to the that task force, yeah. the traffic force. Um, depending board. again, depending the on sort of the type of project. So mm -hmm. for the routine types of projects, yeah. that yes, it, it's mainly um, their jurisdiction to think about this, which is what they already do. Um, and, and the town engineer is ultimately he's the one that is responsible for paving the roads, and he's part of this task force. So, so uh, the PTTF instead of doing South Main as a diet might suggest we do a link to Summer and then a link over to Woburn back to Main. They, they have variability in what they can do. Well, in that case, um, yeah. it's, I believe it would be the, um, the MPO or MassDOT that would be able, doing the analysis to determine whether a lane diet is uh, appropriate on Main Street. Yeah, because it's Main Street. But, but are we f free to choose other of course, know, yeah, this is alternatives sort of to that to, to achieve the same end? Yes, these are sort of, again, the bikers from A to B. <laughs> so guidelines or things sure. to consider, yes. Okay, so these, are, these aren't. Mandates. mandates that yeah, so is okay. that the way you characterize this, Chris, as, as guidelines? I mean, because that there's a, when I look at this thing, and, I, and I've been to one of the one of the meetings, and I, and I thought it was highly informative and productive. And then I've read this, and I kind of come away with two different messages. Right. I'm trying to clarify, mm -hmm. in my mind anyway. Maybe it's just me that's maybe I'm not that swift and I can't figure it out. Um, it strikes me that there's guidelines, and then I read a little further, and it makes me feel like if you adopt this, this is what you have to do. Yeah. It's intended to be guidelines so that you're going to start, you're going to ensure that you think about it and consider it. It's not a requirement. But you're not mandated. So, in order to get so it's fund. not going to hold up funding if we decide yeah, that we don't want to do this you aspect. Want funding, you, you do this. I, I get that. that. So if you're using somebody you else's money and they want you to do it a certain way, yeah. then right. you know yeah. you got to. You have to deal with whoever's giving you the money. This, but this absolutely does not cede local control. Okay. I guess that's the that's, big that's, that's, yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm where you were, John. I, read, I saw both money. of those. Yeah, I, I saw it both ways. That I, and I, you know, and I'm just fearful that kind of the road application of yeah. a policy yeah. sometimes gets you into trouble. So. Right. So uh, if we vote to adopt this. Everything we see here is not cast in concrete. I don't think it changes anything to P with lots of T's and F's, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Something like that. We've got to come up with something. I would, I would like to add that the CPDC did review both the policy mm -hmm. and the bike and pet plan and made recommendations that the board endorse and adopt both. Um, one comment that one of the uh, members of the CPDC did point out that this does give them even more, that much more teeth when it comes to subdivision rules and regulations. They, they're always, um, not always, but many times they're approached by the developer to waiver on sidewalk installations or roadway widths or this and that. When sometimes they're felt, you know, put in an odd situation, whereas when they have another policy or another document to say, you know, this is how the town feels about these sort of facilities. We really want to make sure that they're included in our new developments because if they're not, Who's going to provide them later when the roadway is accepted by the town? So. And we like optional teeth. <laughs> yes, yeah, we optional do like optional teeth. <laughs> is, speaking of optional teeth, is there a way? <laughs> is there a way if um, if the um, complete streets policy is um, accepted? Is there a way within year one or year two or the initial period? The board could get a read on kind of the applicability of it. So we can get a sense of how the E F F T is is uh, applying this. Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> Simply because it's new and its its applicability may be an interest to the board. It would be to me, just to me. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. If the board would like some sort of annual yeah. report on these actions or exemptions that were taken by. The PTTDF. Not just annual, but when you're doing something that's compliant with the complete streets, uh, you yeah. yep. just as an advisor, hey, this is an opportunity, it's compliant, this is what we're doing. Or or not. Or not. Show not. Right. Yeah. 
And that way it's not on autopilot. You kind of, yeah. if we support it, we kind of get a read at the first couple of, of attempts to employ it to make sure it kind of fits our view of it as well. Yeah, and I think I haven't been part of the PTTF as long as other folks, but it's my understanding from other staff that they've already been doing a lot of these things the whole time. Okay. So yeah. um, we just don't do the last step, which you just suggested. Exactly. Which isn't that hard. So yeah. put it on paper. Yeah. Bob's just going to throw it in our report every Yeah, time. well, no, I won't do that. <laughs> Okay, any other questions from the board? Or <coughs> Chris is there? All right, very good. Thank you very much Thanks. for your time tonight. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we have two other motions here. Is, are the, sure. is the board comfortable with moving ahead to adopt these policies, or would you want to read them and take them out? One's a policy, and one's a plan, I guess. Right. Yeah. I, I think my impression is that the, the policy seems like I'm comfortable. Some, you know, yeah. comfortable adopting the, the the plan. I haven't read all the way through. Yeah, I have to right. admit, I know I've had it a couple of times, but it, yeah. I, I have not read through it fully. Um, and I, I know Mr. Halsey has looked at this quite a bit and has been to meetings, so maybe he has a better recommendation on that. I, I will say that having having worked with the CPBC extensively on other things and seen them discuss this the first time around, if they if they feel comfortable with it. Uh, uh, I, I, that would, they, would, they voted to adopt it? They did vote okay. to adopt yeah. both, correct? Yes. And they voted so to recommend that we do the same. And right? they voted yeah. to Yeah, they, they voted that the board adopted their, since, yeah. as the roadway so, closures. So, so in, in my mind, I'm, I, I'd be pretty comfortable, but I, I haven't read it, so yeah. I don't have to yeah. I haven't fully read it through. So we can in good faith adopt this policy and then a dissent on the road diet if we so Absolutely. choose. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And then you can do that or, or accept it as we so choose. <laughs> So the, the road diet is part of the plan that we're oh. being added. Is that, no. do I have that right? It's not. No, okay. That's just it's kind one of, of many tools. It's, okay. a, it's okay. a standalone, right. you know, yeah, item. Yeah. Before you make a motion, if you want, Gene, if you want to come up and just give the update of the South Main Street diet, which is there is no real update. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all the information before you proceed. Hello, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, Diets. Don't we all love to talk about diets? Um, so the road diet is really um, something that is conceptual at this point. Um, I think you know by now when we do anything in planning, we have many, many, many meetings. Um, witness from the Zoning Advisory Committee having 40 public meetings uh, related to the zoning bylaw changes that will be proposed next fall. So. Uh, I just want to preface by saying it's not like we're a bunch of planners that are going to run out there and, and start changing around lanes without a lot of public dialogue, um, first and foremost. Um, we haven't even gone there yet. But more importantly, um, this is really under the jurisdiction of MassDOT at the state. And so um, a meeting we had there several months back, uh, we started talking about one issue that could really be a problem for this concept, which is the number of driveways that are um, throughout, particularly yeah. South Main Street, my mm -hmm. North Main Street as well. Um, we need to understand that better with the help of MassDOT and a couple of the engineering folks there. We're going to really take a critical eye at that because if if there's too many, yeah. you'll have head-on collisions. Yeah, <laughs> this, this yeah. isn't going to work for right. Yeah. So we're asking a lot of questions right up front and, and really. Um, being clear that we want a lot of public dialogue if we can overcome that first hurdle of the driveways. And I'm not sure we can. Uh, that being said, we have a unique, I guess I'll call it an opportunity, to see what it might be like to modify these lanes when the water main project goes through. That'll be a real test during construction of what it's like when you move lanes around. Yeah, you'll get to see what it feels like. Yeah. 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 So that will give us a little peek. <coughs> so by embracing this policy and plan, we're really not embracing an endorsement of those changes. Yeah. And that's, I think, Completely really wrong. important. Yeah. I think it's important for the public to understand yeah. right, that, you know, conceptually, in, in my mind, and I have looked at these a lot, both policy and the plan, conceptually make so much sense. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it starts the service, you know, a huge cross section of our citizens, right. not mm -hmm. just the drivers or just the bikers or just the walkers. It's kind of 
you know, a coexistent kind of thing. And so philosophically, I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. As right. long as it's not locking us down to anything that, you know, we later discover mm -hmm. right. the, yeah. too many pitfalls for us to embrace. The or, devil is in the details. Or, yes. or it comes back what you offer. I don't want to pass it without reading it, I guess, yes. is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Kind of legislator. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> He's a new politician. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> that's kind of the genesis of getting a brief. Whenever these, whenever something that's appropriately part of the complete streets is brought to the fore, I'd be curious. Maybe other members of the board. Yeah. Would do. It could be two-minute discussion. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It sounds like the sense of the board is mm -hmm. ready to move forward. Dan, move that the board of selectmen adopt the town of Reading complete streets policy as amended. Okay, Marcy seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor? 5 0. Move the Board of Selectmen adopt the Town of Reading Bike and Pedestrian Plan as amended. Do I have a second? Second. Marcy second. Seconds. Yeah. Discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor? 5 0. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. It's a late evening. <laughs> Not too bad. Actually, we're right on time. Not too good. Caught up. How do we do that? <laughs> I don't know, do we? we what do we throw off? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> let, me let, me, let, me, let me check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> my phone's on right. That's correct. That's four minutes. That's four minutes faster than my phone. That's my phone. It feels like it. Oh, the sunny side ferry didn't take half an hour. That's, oh, right. that's true. Yeah. Oh, that's took all four minutes. That's right. Okay. The other the other discussion in here tonight is regards the uh, 2020 Reading 2020 discussion. You guys will remember that we met on that Saturday morning at, at Jordan's, uh, along with some of the, the town heads, and talked about our focus areas of interest. And we divvied ourselves up into four groups. I should say Bob and Gene managed and facilitated the meeting and much of the discussion. Um, discussion now is so what, how do we put that to, to work? Um, what are folks' thoughts at the end of, uh, of that, that round of planning in terms of proceeding? Um, I have some initial thoughts that I think one, two, and three are, are quite different from four, and just so everyone knows. Uh, one is community partners, uh, Kevin, Dan, and myself, and that's to get out and compile a list of all the organizations in town. And there's many different ways we're already starting to do that. Um, I'll tell you, I was at a meeting, I think it was last week, on the cultural uh, grant, and they are compiling exhaustive lists of anything that sounds like cultural. It's, it's unbelievable how many organizations are our um, So between that, the Chamber of Commerce and other groups, we have a really large list. Um, and then the second part of that is, all right, what do they do? And what overlaps? And that'll take some, some work and take some thinking. Um, as, as Gene says, we've been on a rubber chicken circuit. There's actually a fair amount of interest in the business community to engage with town government in a forward-looking way. Um, but not to just have endless discussions on policy, to do something right now. And I think they understand that that's kind of where our heads are at, too. Um, the next group is services and performance measurement. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more about this as a topic tomorrow night at the financial forum broadly. Uh, Marcy and Jean, we're going to look at this. And this is, if you will, a list of services that just town government provides. So we've got the community on one hand and all the groups, and then the second part, if you will, is town government. What are the things we do? And given that we do them, can they all be measured? And some of them will be difficult to measure. Some of them are easy to measure. How many building permits did you issue? How good of a job did you do issuing a permit? That's a little more subjective. It kind of gets into customer service. Um, and then communication is, OK, you've, you've identified all these different resources. Who does what? Who overlaps? How do we communicate to the public? And we're going to also hear FinCom talk a lot about that tomorrow night and get some feedback from whoever comes on what are better ways to communicate. Is this such a thing? I don't think there's any one way that's going to solve any of our problems. 
I think you're going to find the answer is do as many different things as you can. Um, I sent one of my colleagues a, what I thought was a very humorous uh, conference call, the invitation today, and it's how to teach governments how to disengage from using Facebook because it's already proved to be a bad idea in the public se sector. This other social media you should be using. So, Pete, if you're watching, I told you. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the point the point of communication is whatever we decide today is going to be different in about three months. We have to decide to be very flexible and very adaptable and listen to teenagers because they're the ones that are going to tell us all the different ways to communicate when they're away from their smartphones. Which would be yeah. don't leave a voicemail. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are some businesses now that um, have banned emails in certain, at least in certain ways, mm -hmm. within the organization. You just can't use them. We're not there yet. And I, th and I think these three things somewhat stand on their own and, and they may overlap, but I think the fourth one is, is different. And it's, uh, it's called strategic planning. John Arena, John Halsley, uh, Jimmy, Greg, and Ruth. And that's where I had asked for your help uh, late last week of identifying, and we don't have to solve this tonight, what are the key areas strategic planning wise that we want to address? And I'll preface those remarks with some of them we've already had executive sessions on and are not really appropriate to discuss in public fully. Mm -hmm. So we may have to just give it a broad name, but we'll all understand what that means. Uh, many of the strategic planning uh, things are quite public right now. And just for anyone that's listening, it's, if it's not public now, it will be soon. Uh, so at some point in the future, if we're looking for any action, it's not like we're going to do anything in secret. We'll go to a town meeting, we'll ask for whatever it is we think we want with good reason. And at that point, it will be defended. Um, but there are certain things that are subject to executive uh, session strategically that we're just not able to disclose at this point in time. So it's really up to the board, ultimately, uh, with as much help as you can get from staff as to, I don't know if you want to list all the strategic planning things and then mm -hmm. prioritize them or just do them off the top of your head and say what's important. I started to write down something to share with you tonight, and there's just so many things. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it just is. You know, and then I, I think this one's really important. Let me write it down. And then I come back in a day and go, well, that's not as nearly as important as this one here. So, you know, every day is different, and depending on what you're dealing with, that seems more important. We're going to have to find some way as a group to prioritize because all of it is just not possible. Uh, maybe some of it feeds on its other. Maybe we can get help from the community, the business community, the cultural community. That's, that's our objective. Um, but that's kind of the fourth part of this piece is what are the actual action items we'd like to take? Because that's what everyone wants, and, and I certainly want, and I, I know you want. So what do we want to accomplish? So I'd almost say the way to approach this um, is really to look ahead and what do you want the outcome to be? something, um, whatever, all day kindergarten should be mm -hmm. at town hall, whatever it is, whatever it is you want, let's then figure out what are the paths to get there. Um, I think it should be the town forest. Way <laughs> 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 up high? <laughs> yeah. second, story, <laughs> second story of Burbank, yeah. <laughs> and, then, bound. and then another set of things might be, you don't really know the outcome, but you know a process you want to engage in, that you want to explore something. There's a certain real estate idea. It's worth exploring. We don't know that exactly where we'll end up with it, where all day kindergarten will go, but we know it's an idea we need to explore. So, you know, I just opened the floor. There's a couple of departments here. And what do you think the important strategic planning items are? And I will tell you tomorrow night, what you're going to hear from the Finance Committee is a discussion. I, I know you, you saw the agenda of the importance of understanding we have very limited resources. We can't do everything for everyone. So as a town, we have to come together and, and understand, you know, I was really surprised at Mark's fourth one, but it was one of the things, is anyone willing to stand up and tell tell us what item gets too much fun? Like, I can't wait to see the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from the town manager. <laughs> It'll be interesting. And it will be interesting, because when we asked that question in 2010, what services are offered by the town that you use you could do without, the answer was this. So yeah. that's the thing. People will get up and say that um, if they have school-aged children, you can cut the elder services. Right. If, if 
aged out of you needing the schools, that you can cut the schools. That's yeah. unfortunately the way I also way think the question really is really works. hard to answer in that people don't necessarily correlate level of service with spending, at least not right. at the first meeting, right? What is a dollar worth? What is 10000 worth? And that's where, you know, the selectmen uh, especially are, you're the gatekeeper near the end, just before FinCom and town meeting in May. Um, you have a sense of the whole picture. Very few folks do. They have a sense of their urgent priority of what they want and what they see, and they just don't understand necessarily all the rest. And that's why, as I try to sit down and evaluate strategic plans, my head was just starting to explode. There's just too many things. Um, you know, and that's not a bad problem to have. It's a lot better than being myopic and saying, no, there's nothing at all. There's only two things. But we have to be able to share that multitude with everyone in some way so that they understand. It's not that yours isn't important. It, it just tucks in here at number 89, you know, between other, other things. The other thought is I, I think you've got to, the action to accomplish a goal, if your action isn't the one that gets picked, you should still have some affinity to the goal, whether it's, yeah. let's say it's growing the business community. You may have an idea, your idea is 89. If your goal is achieved in alternative ways, we're all part of the benefit part that benefits that. And I get the point that your 89, number 89 didn't get delivered. But that's an action that delivers some mm -hmm. of the same benefits. So affinitizing these up into um, mission, and what's the mission of this, or what's the end goal? I guess you, you also would point that the path you get there is another way to look at it. It's more critical to me than what are the individual steps that you do in spending or actions. It's what's the end goal. You know, begin with the end in mind kind of thing. I'll tell you one of the things that Gene and I especially have talked about is, is it there's a real deep need in this community to have a multi-board summit because mm -hmm. lots of boards understand their mission and they really don't know how it fits in and they may not care. Right. Mm -hmm. and they don't have to care, but they should understand. They should understand, you know, you're this piece of the pie. These other folks are the other pieces of the pie. You know, and the selectmen see the whole thing. So when you're coming to them, understand that you're just a part of what they're seeing. Give a thought how you do that. Well, uh, just to have invite multi, many boards together. Whether we were debating whether to do chairs and vice chairs only for size, but it really you really almost have to sit down and decide all boards or certain boards, and that's a tough one. John. Well, from a strategic planning standpoint, the thing that we have to be very careful mm -hmm. of is that if it gets too, if too many things are thought to be strategic, right. mm -hmm. then suddenly what you have is a yeah. binder that two people have to lift and you put it on the yeah. shelf and nobody could ever take it down and work on it because right. it's just so, big. It's like so onerous that you just yeah. can't go there. And then you end up with nothing at the end except yeah. an old strategic plan that nobody ever looked at and now you determine you have to have a new strategic plan. I mean, that, yeah. um, I, I say this from sad experience <laughs> um, so you know so f strategically I mean if you pick four or five pillars to build around <coughs> that can be in a constant state of re-examination then you know then the plan can take take life and it actually can start moving down the road and so I think we've got to be very careful that we don't get paralyzed by inaction, saying the thing is so big, oh my God, we got to keep thinking until we get everything that's correct on the list, and then, and, and you know what will happen is, I'm already old, so I mean, you know, I, I could be dead by the time we get to the end of that, yeah. <laughs> that you know, adventure. So, I think, I think what we need to do is, I mean, we've got a so for in strategic planning, for example, we've got a small subgroup. Yeah. And maybe what that subgroup does is it, it gets together, you know, um, once every two weeks for, you know, a month or two and comes up, comes back with, here's what we think, you know, here's kind of the pillars of where we go. Once those are agreed on, you can take all that huge list and compartmentalize it. You know, I mean, in other words, and I actually believe that there's probably only four or five major things <coughs> and everything else will fit as a subgroup right. and then to your point yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody feels enfranchised that they're yeah. you know that they're being addressed it's top down not bottom up 
Yeah, it really is. I mean, if we get if we try to start too wide, boiling. We'll, we just, we'll never get down the road. You have too many numbers. So it, it can become very wide and very inclusive as the plan starts to unfold. I mean, it's it's kind of a hmm. it's a tactical approach to. And there are many tactical approaches to creating a strategic plan, but you know, I think we just got to get going. Well, I've seen yeah. facilitators use the old uh, sticky approach, where you yeah. you put down your piece of the puzzle on a sticky, goes yep. up on a board, and then someone comes in and starts grouping things. Yeah, it's the KJ exercise. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. and that is, I think that's, the, I think that's the way to do it. And I think we can start at the subcommittee level and then report. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think what we're going to find is that these other three these other three things are big, and they all have a there's a functional connection to the strategic, strategic plan. plan. They fit underneath they the strategic do. plan. Uh, so, so, you know, my suggestion is it's a long journey. Let's take the first step. Let's just keep cooking, you know. And, uh, Another thing you're going to hear tomorrow night from the Finance Committee is a very strong interest in doing multi-year budgeting, not just one year, mm -hmm. let's come back in here. One year, let's come back. They want to take a crack at doing a two-year budget. What are the advantages to that? Um, there'll be less time wasted in the second year if everyone climbs on board of the concept. And again, the backdrop of all this is the presumption that there is no override next April. But let's put something together for two years with the idea that if the town wants more or better, it's going to have to pony up for it. Again, you're going to hear a lot of this tomorrow. And now, I, I've thought about it. There's no harm in doing it. I will say that that doesn't mean you don't do it the second year, because you still have to re-examine all your assumptions and your priorities, because things change, and you have to be flexible. And you know what the chief might have wanted two years ago for a second year, he might not want at, you know a year later, and that's fine. But at least if there's some planning, stronger planning element brought in financially. Everyone will understand. Look, we're going to use a million and a half of free cash in the first year and a million and a half of the second year, and that's it. There's some wild cards out there. We don't know what state aid is. Um, we're going through an RFP process for health insurance, where we will be in the fall. There's a possibility we'll get a two year quote, which would be really helpful for this exercise. Mm -hmm. There's only one vendor that can do that, so if they're successful, that would be a helpful thing. Uh, but the Finance Committee would like to take a shot at a two-year budget, not purely voted, just vote the first year, have already done a lot of work on the second year. Well, you know, the two-year budget is done every year. I mean, that's kind of the nature of the that's way something it I'm struggling with. You have to do it every well, year. Well, that's what I do, but yeah. I'm not sure a lot of other people do. Think of it the I same do way. two or three years at a time. Yeah, I mean, right. that's yeah. kind of, I mean, you, have to. Right. you know, as I get closer and closer to retirement, that's what I was doing all the time, yeah. just personally, is, you, you know, you, I mean, you look at, you look at three years, but you got to do it every year, you know. Otherwise, you know, because because there's a dynamic to it. So, I, you know, I actually think it's a really healthy thing to do a two-year budget as long as you do it every year. Well, your your out years are plus or minus ten percent. Your, your, your near near term is plus or minus two or three. You know. Yeah. yeah. Accurate. Right. And it's a different thing for me to do it as opposed to it to be a public discussion. Mm -hmm. I can do it. No one has to care. But if the school committee and the board of selectmen is engaged in thinking about two years at a time and discussing in public, it changes the dynamic a bit. Because it also allows you to say, we need these six things. Mm -hmm. We can do two, and then we can do two, and two won't get done at all. But don't you think, Bob, that that is going to be very eye-opening to our citizens? Because in the very short time that I've been a selectman, I have come to a conclusion that there has not been enough money printed in the history of man to do what everybody wants to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that they don't they don't mean it, you know, they don't know in, in a in a in a in a greedy way. They just kind of you know, sometimes don't grasp the whole picture and I think the idea of doing this in public helps people understand that. It's because individually what any one person or group wants is not that large. It's the collection of all 25,000 <laughs> sitting in the same place and all want something that gets large. I don't, I don't mean to steal tomorrow night's thunder, but what other expense side or 
uh, items would you need to kind of know on a two-year basis besides health insurance? Labor we have all our labor contracts, labor. or most of them, negotiated, which is really helpful. So we will know those two years again. Well, the school cases, yes. Those okay. things are only going to help you the first year. The next year, when you go to do your two-year plan, or doing your one year, you know. Mm -hmm. The next year, you don't know. So well, it's really it's a one-year plan and a one-year lookout. It's right. not really it's a, a right, right. 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 It's a, it's a one-year plan and a one-year lookout. But it helps you forecast going into those negotiations because right. you kind of know where you kind of know your own yeah, sounds. Right. If it's said that way, I think you get it. If you mm -hmm. say it to your, when you first said it, I'm yeah. saying you're on autopilot year one for year two. Can't yeah. be that. Right. Well, I, I think it could be eye opening to see what has changed dramatically in a year in terms of where now you're suddenly asking for money, whereas you were last time. And I things think do be change. Very interesting. Absolutely, yeah. things do change. I know from the years on FinCom that what you think you're going to need or where you think you're going to need to spend could change a lot in a year. But it gives you that additional way to look at things. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you from my, my former position, sometimes I was quite surprised to hear of something that was suddenly very urgent in what would be the second year that wasn't even brought up the first year. And many times there was a reason for it. Sometimes it was poor planning. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell you last year because I knew you, you were in a bad mood. Now I really need it or else. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to wait until it had to be done. <laughs> so, and Mark Doxer also wants to... Um, possibly even early, identify some what we've traditionally called community priorities. So for instance, mm -hmm. we did substance abuse jointly with the schools. We laid out a plan involved hiring uh, in the police department and hiring the school department. And I think we spent 500 odd thousand split in some way between us over a year. Mm -hmm. And actually in that case, we had a two year plan. The schools never fully followed through on it. They changed their priorities, which is fine. Yeah. But he wants to get out the notion of um, you know, is there a priority that's different than the usual budget process that any of you have? Right. And get that question out. Right? Mm -hmm. I will tell you, and I, I won't speak for FinCom, but it left a bad taste in my mouth the way the budget process worked at the end of the last year, mm -hmm. where those that asked the loudest were funded. Uh, yeah, I, that, um, that should was, have been a that was a very that poor process. Much earlier. Very poor. And, you know, Finance Committee may or may not be a policy body, and that may have not been a policy statement, but the point was it shouldn't have been decided at the last minute with limited audience participation, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And they don't agree with that, which is their right. But I think if we take this approach, we'll get a lot of this discussion up front so that that'll at least give FinCom the ammunition of saying at the last minute, why didn't you tell us that? We've been asking for it for months. Right. Don't come to me at the last minute and say this. Whether they choose to use it that way or not is their choice. So I don't know. Um, you know, five of you want to get together. I'll probably join you, or we can break into smaller groups for that strategic planning. Mm -hmm. um, having everyone on deck would be useful. Maybe having some of the department heads kind of do some group think. Well, don't you think in the strategic planning area, if the subcommittee meets first? And I, and I do think you should add yourself to that, Bob. I, I can't imagine you not being part of that. But, you know, um, the chief and, and John, you and I, I, I think if we take a take a shot at this yeah. in, a, in a group that's exactly. really manageable, we're not going to get everything, but we're going to get, you know, a foundation Give together. it two or three sessions, maybe yeah. two or three weekends. And then like, bring it back and, you know, and, your and, and, you know <laughs> and have a completely open dialogue with everybody about what did we what did we miss you know what did we you know did we look at something way too hard and you know get some other input but another important <coughs> part of this which I think the town has not done so well in the past which Ed said can help us learn is just because you do a good job of something doesn't mean it mattered mm -hmm. right um, we need to identify up front does it matter Instead of just saying this would be something we could do and accomplish actually in the next year and check it off, okay, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What, why? You I doing? thought that was a really telling approach. Is it relevant? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought the EdSAP presentation was just so eye opening. Just yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's part of the strategic plan it has to be advertising yeah. our strengths and getting mm -hmm. credit for it in the public yeah. domain. Absolutely. That was that was a really productive and informative session I, I thought um, I wish we would add more people at it and yeah. um, 
and more directly connect to people uh, as well. No. And, yeah. and part of strategic planning can't but help involve the schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some some portion of right. this is going to overlap, right. and you're going to have to involve the schools and the school mm -hmm. committee, and I assume they'll be fine with it. Mm -hmm. You know, John and I have started talking about sharing certain positions. Good. He needs something. We need something. It's pretty comparable. Why don't we do half and half? I don't know if that'll go anywhere as a practical matter, but it's nice to have that dialogue. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it is the way. I mean, it's kind of the way of the world. I mean, it's kind of everything is marching in that direction from nonprofits to corporations to municipalities. Mm -hmm. So we might as well do it inside of our we might own. Might as well use our own shared services. Right. <laughs> you know, and another resource we all have for regionalization <laughs> is we have a lot of volunteer hours. How can these boards help? Right. I thought mm -hmm. about it, but I haven't solved it by any means. But you know, Gene and I did have a discussion, and John, you were at one of the board health meetings where right. we effectively gave them a task. Right. Said, here, you guys got to figure this out. We can't figure it out. And they seem very energized they by did. that, actually. I mean, I think, I, I suspect most of the committees might have a similar, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I wonder, a, a similar reaction. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we have a lot of resource there. You know, yeah. we're saying we don't have the resources to do a lot of things, but we've got more resources than we think. So, I don't know, do you guys have anything to throw in? <coughs> You're not that busy, right? <laughs> no. Okay. I just wanted to add one thing, um, which is, um, as part of the work we're going to be doing in developing an economic development plan, uh, we're going to be, we've got some grant money to do this plan, and we're going to be doing a visioning session, a, a couple of visioning sessions, but visioning is part of the plan. And it's an interesting exercise to do some visioning because um, in economic development, uh, what it means for Reading could be very different than what it means for other communities like Upper Arlington or, or even, you know, even Wakefield. Um, and, and try and, you know, I'm a big proponent of um, sort of knowing uh, knowing your audience and understanding what the community goals are because um, you know I could come up with an economic development plan that looks like Davis Square in Somerville and people would say well, that's not Reading you know that's Davis Square um, so I think that's that's been uh, 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 as we've seen I, I believe in the zoning work that we've done um, having those public forums and being able to get public input as we try and craft new language has been really helpful and has been part of the redraft, including that public input. Not just having a public meeting and, you know, putting up a PowerPoint and saying, all right, everybody, that's what we're going to do, see you later. You know, actually getting the input and then using it somehow in the, the new um, vision and the new planning process. So um, the, it, it's tricky to, to figure out how to get public input. <coughs> you have a meeting and you think people are going to come and you know it's always a little disappointing that you don't get more people to show up. So Jean, do you think that if we, if we as a first approach went to the committees yeah. Because you see, they they've got a little bit more of a vested interest. They've stepped up yeah. already. They've mm -hmm. said, you know, I'm I'm willing to serve, and maybe that's the place you start this kind of storyboard visioning, and you kind of have an instant audience. You know, kind of to your point. I mean, yeah, and, and maybe you start, you know, with the chair and the vice chair, but then it can expand and. From there, it can grow some public legs mm -hmm. and, and get and get more people involved in the vision. That's the way a strategic plan gets executed when it has buy-in from you know, the exact opposite. It's bottom-up buy-in you know, yeah. instead of top-down. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we're doing. Because then, if you haven't been part of the process, the kind of that storyboard visioning process, you don't care yeah. if you haven't been part of it. I, th I think there's two parts to that too. I mean, the first part I, I definitely agree with you know you, to get that vision go out there and say this is what we're really interested in doing and, and talk to the, the the boards whether whether it's just the chair and vice chair or the entire board and say you know this is something of interest to us this is something that's that's you think is going to have some value to you and then almost do the same thing that they did with the headset then take that information and go out to the public and say 
this is what we're thinking about yeah. doing. Do you have any value now? No, well, you could do that, but that's not going to help. You know, you'll probably get a lot of answers like that. So it would be good to kind of start out that way. But I think that ultimately you do have to go out there and say, does it matter? Yeah. You know, take that information that you've gathered now and go out and say, hey, does this matter to you? Does this, does it, this, does this not? And, and see what the kind of information you get. I think ultimately if you're not going out there with that same mentality at the end, you know, you're probably just going to end up spinning your wheels to a degree on with a strategic plan. I think you need to, to actually find out, like, how much does this matter to you? Because given given no price tags on it, everything, everything is important. <laughs> True, so right. it, it, you have to have some way of, of gathering how important is this to you, not just is it important, yeah, because yeah, then yeah. Not everybody else yeah. say, oh, yeah, I want it all. Right, well, that's true. And that's by true. the way, could you lower my taxes? Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, <laughs> so. you have to rank them. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be, so wouldn't it be interesting to be able to take a dollar of your real estate taxes and actually pie chart that thing. We've well, we have that. that. Past. We have it's not that that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it, I think if you drill it down deep enough, it might be. I, I don't know. Yeah. You know. I mean, would you trade off this in the, favor of not having an increase of another dollar? I mean, you know, for, for better or worse, at least historically, the budget doesn't change much every year. That pie looks about the same. Ten years ago, did it look different? Yeah, health insurance is probably a smaller slice. Right. But other things? Back 30 years, yeah, we had three times bigger DPW in a smaller school department. Right. But year to year, when you're talking about an inch here and there, um, is that right or wrong? I think it would be turmoil to make massive changes every year. Wouldn't it be but interesting <coughs> to be able to forecast into that, though, Bob, right. the strategic plan? So yeah. if the plan, if the visioning process drove a certain kind of plan, and then you could forecast the look of that pie chart out five years or ten years. That could be very telling in what you really want on that list. I mean, you know, maybe that fifth thing, not that important when you that look at it. That helps you to decide where are we shaving, where are we growing to get to where we want to be. And, and our opportunities to do anything meaningful are so limited because we're landlocked. Right. You know, if we had big choices to be made with big parcels of land, this would be a really interesting exercise. But, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and that again, that kind of attacks the revenue side a little more than the expense side. But it also may determine we're going to attract a lot of school kids in by having a lot of housing. That's important to know. Or we're going to go for you know, commercial and we wouldn't do that. So we're not going to change the demographics of the community all that much, or you know, the composition of the community. You know, Reading kind of is what it is, and to change it would be hard to imagine. You know, you're 90-10, you can't get 80-20, even if you want to. Mm -hmm. well, you'd be very hard pressed to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you'd have to have a major change in the way the thing, the town is laid out. <coughs> we can take every ninth house by MN domain. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make a comment, too, about um, the Community Preservation Act. And based on the conversation that we had at the start of the meeting about um, how concerned people were about losing historic structures and the fabric of neighborhoods, um, I worked a lot with it in my previous job in the city of Peabody. And for a city to have the Community Preservation Act, it's pretty rare, um, especially a kind of a blue collar city like Peabody was. Um, but they collected 1% under that tax, and we we did a lot of open space preservation, community preserva uh, historic preservation, and um, recreation facilities and, and open space too. So, um, and housing, affordable housing as well. And I'm not advocating for more taxes, but as we have the dialogue about um, how can we, you know, what are our priorities as a community, that's a potential resource and I'm not saying that could solve the problem for 186 Summer Ave, but um, it is something to think about. And I know, I think it passed, it missed by just a few votes. Yeah, I was always surprised it was brought once and it narrowly missed and then it just then never it just came back. Mm -hmm. it, it missed by within a few percent at the ballot box. You know, and I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but I was just surprised that, okay, skip it. I think the sense of the board, if I'm hearing correctly, is that we would try to get this board together with you, Bob, and maybe some department heads over two or three okay. couple-hour sessions and start to use 
yellow stickies, white mark, whiteboard markers, and start to look at what are the four or five pillars, and where do some of these other aspects plug in? And I think you'll start to see a flavor of that tomorrow night, because it's, you know, again, FinCom's going to ask questions and just get a lot of ideas thrown up on a whiteboard, right. and then later going to say, all right, what's important? Go throw a yellow dot next to it. I suspect it'll be similar to, you know, the brainstorming sessions we had since Mark was the one that, right. that, that facilitated those sessions. I'm sure billboards will come up and be very... <laughs> <laughs> I think what those are dead. <laughs> I think those are completely dead. One of the things we're trying to do with the community partners is, is see what can possibly be outsourced meaningfully. Yep. I don't know if they're looking for that kind of a flavor on, you know, if there's services the town can't provide that you want, what are the alternatives other than paying more taxes? Can we possibly well, can you shift that? these over? Yeah. Well, Do they want to hear any of that tomorrow, or is it pretty much um, It's probably a little early for that, but... Um, uh, you know, it might not be bad. That actually was the only thing that people did vote for was privatizing trash pickup. Mm -hmm. Despite oh. the fact that the, that the contract that, yeah, that we'd gotten well, was tremendously out of really good contract. But <laughs> That was the one thing that people voted for when they had to vote for something Plus they already the, had. They weren't getting the <laughs> deduction on the taxes. Right. As opposed to an override for the trash. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of services the town offers that residents are indifferent as to who offers them. Right. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, we have to think as a business, even though we're not, do we have a competitive advantage? Are we offering this because we're better at it? Or not? And sometimes the answer is yes. I'd be hard pressed to know how any private organization could do recreation better. I just don't know how. Yeah. They might right. do as well on a really good day. <coughs> but there's other things too. When you're doing one thing with one person, whatever it is, how good can you really be? You have to have a really exceptional person. And is that a good business model? As opposed to recreation is so dear to the whole community. John Feuder's not allowed to leave, but if he did, <laughs> the community would still be interested. It should in always be an interchangeable. You, you yeah. know, that should not be tied yeah. to one person. Right? Yeah, Although when you have one right. person that's very good, yeah. you don't I mean, want to lose them. You, you <laughs> like to hang on to them, but that's got to be an inter. That's they got to be an interchangeable part. To well, that. That's, that's been your mantra, I think, all along. Well, and that's why you have to engage the boards because in some cases the boards are involved in that field, whatever it is, rec committee, whatever, board of health, <coughs> you know, and, and make sure they understand. That's why I think the visioning, perking up through the committees first, is actually yeah. a, not a bad idea. It kind of accomplishes the thing you're talking about, that the both of you are talking mm -hmm. about, kind of coming at it from different directions. So. Well, there are some, for sure, that would have strong opinions. Thanks. Think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and others I don't know. So. Okay, well, we'll see how tomorrow goes. I'll, I'll put a lot on paper for the August meeting because um, we need to start figuring out goals. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and even if it's only 10 or 20 of them instead of 50. Well, can we begin engaging the subcommittee? You know, Absolutely. From the standpoint yeah. of you know, just saying, okay, we're going to pick a date you know, in mid or late August and, and you know, spend a couple of hours together. And yeah, I, I, I wanted to have a discussion with some of the department heads. I don't think we have the fact that one person volunteered for everything is fine. We don't have enough people in some of them. Mm -hmm. So as an example, uh, Sharon is on communication. Sharon will be incommunicado for the next six to eight well, weeks because it's the end of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So she's not going to be of any help, and she'd be the first to tell you that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't want it not to happen. So we'll just kind of double up in some cases on some of these things. Okay. All right. Next topic for discussion on our agenda tonight is uh, the town manager evaluation process. Bob celebrated his one year anniversary in June. What was the date? Oh. I, I passed it June 1st. I didn't celebrate it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in your packet tonight are evaluation formats used. Uh, for the prior town manager and, the, and a prior board, I would add. Um, the discussion before us is the mechanism to go through and evaluate the current town manager. 
You're going to project that on the screen? No, I'm not going to. I think we just have a chat. Um, and I included a couple of examples from other towns pretty much randomly. I, I looked at a dozen or so and tried to pick kind of two different types. Um, I have to be honest that most of the evaluations online of town managers look the same, one community to the next. It's usually a scale of one to five. You very rarely see anything below a three, and a three is bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I've always had a problem with that scale. Most of the places I've worked with have had a problem with that. Okay. But, you know, three, three is what? Three is average. Three is average, average and yeah. it's not yeah. a bad grade. And yeah. fours and fives are truly exceptional stuff. Yeah. So a three O was a very adequate review. But yeah. And it gets more, inflated. The more you, the more granularity you put there, the yeah. more difficult it becomes. I, I'd be happy with, frankly, a a three level that describes it as meets expectations, yeah. exceeds, yeah. or yeah. you know, needs needs that's even better. And that's even better. Yeah. That's what we have yeah. internally. We have three columns. Yeah. The left hand column, which is you didn't do a very good job, is a horrible thing for anyone to have to deal with. Right. Mm -hmm. There's there's economic implications usually. Right. And then it's just a question of are you an average worker or a really good worker in lots of form. I can actually show you the evaluation, maybe it'd be helpful. Blank. Yeah. Blank. Like there's uh, twelve things that everyone's evaluated on, and then another four optional, depending on your job. If you're a supervisor, there's, there's four. But maybe that list would be helpful mm -hmm. for you to see, because that's how everyone else is evaluated here. Mm -hmm. um, I think tonight, though, you should try to identify some sort of a timeline. I don't know if there's a really ideal time to do it, other than it makes logical sense that if we finished a fiscal year and sometime in July, or hopefully July, you get a report of all the goals that were accomplished or not. Then you're in a position to go to the next step. Say, okay, let's take a look back before we stream ahead and just give some kind of yeah. feedback. So probably August generally is a good time. It may not work this year. No, no big deal. Uh, but it is something you probably want to do annually, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I am interested, uh, just speaking for myself, in specific detailed honesty as opposed to generic <laughs> stuff that, so who cares? Um, you know, I'm particularly interested in your feedback on uh, what we didn't do well, what you were disappointed with. It doesn't matter why, just what didn't get done or <coughs> didn't like the way it was done. Um, and I don't, I, I don't mind that in public. <laughs> you know, don't feel like you're being critical and feel bad about it. It's important for me to know that for you to be very honest. Uh, and then it's important for the rest of the organization to understand what you've said mm -hmm. so that they can hear the same message. So when I'm telling them, look, this is important. See, I told you. <laughs> you know, they'll get that. So for instance, if our customer service surveys were showing 50-50 scores instead of the good scores, you should tell me that's unacceptable. And I could say to everyone else, see, I told you it was unacceptable. <laughs> so whatever it is, you know, you collectively believe in, I think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. And again, when you think of the evaluation process, again, in the ones I looked at, it's always one year. It really shouldn't be just one year. Because yeah. so what that you did something and that's measurable in a year? It's, mm -hmm. it's what's the big picture? It's here. the goal, not the activity. Right. Yeah, it's not that you accomplished this task, it's that you took such a good bite out of it that you really set us up for the future. And that'll be your challenge to figure out how to do that. I, so is there a set of goals, Bob, that so well, we don't have goals for next year, but you got the ones from last year for what that was worth. There yeah. were thirty some odd. Right. right. We didn't do any kind of numerical scoring. I could have. Right. Um, I don't know. Three quarters of them got done. Something like that. Um, and then there's lots of things not on the list. <laughs> I didn't bother listing that for you. But if that's the kind of thing you would find helpful, you know, we could do that. Again, back to the marketing theme. We don't spend any time on marketing. This stuff we're talking about tonight is marketing. It's me yeah. marketing to you and the whole organization marketing to me to you. You don't spend a lot of time doing that. Maybe mm -hmm. you should. Now, do you review staff on a fiscal year basis? Correct. Does, is it a disconnect to have you evaluate on a calendar year? Well, I'm, I'm now evaluated on a fiscal year basis, oh, you are. which is why yeah. you should look through June 30th All right. and then as soon as practical. Yeah, that makes sense. Since so have you really just finished that? Process. Yeah, I can't. Um, we normally do it in May, yep. uh, finish it in June, 
and it's a little awkward because yeah, the fiscal gotta, year is not done. But right. you know, everybody has a pretty good sense. You're on a good trajectory because they need to have that information whether they get a step on June 30th yeah. or not. Right. So it makes logical sense. We can do it in July or August and do it in retro, but it's just tradition that we do it this way, and many unions are the same. Um, and you could do me in May or June the same way, but I couldn't give you a final report on goals. Employees can't either, but I don't mind that. It's, I understand, you know, how much progress have you made? I'm not interested in, is it 100 or not? I'm interested in is where is it? You know, and if it's not completed, why not? I, I think it's more valuable doing yours on a post-mortem basis rather than, yeah. you know, yeah. in a forecasted basis. I just, because it gives you the opportunity to finish yeah. up what you're doing with them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have the criteria in our hands to be working on it so that, you know, in a timely way and, you know, you know, not on the, whatever today is, the 29th of July. We, we should be we should be done with that by now and be well, able to have this. You're discussion. still in a reasonable time frame, I think, because yeah. you would have only heard information in July from me. Right. You may have already been at the goal line and just waited for that as a formality. Right. But to be fair, you didn't see it. You can't. Um, and then the schools have a process where I'm not super familiar with it, but the superintendent sits down with each member individually and discusses their evaluation. So they do individual evaluations. And in, you know, in some instances, each school committee member, each school committee member does a separate evaluation that then becomes public, and then there's a collective score. Mm -hmm. So I was a little surprised at that because the other communities I looked at, the town side, it's just a collective score that gets released. So I'm I'm open to whichever way you want to do. You lose your anonymity, you know, if that matters. Mm -hmm. That could be raw. <laughs> I mean, it, it just philosophically speaking, I'm not you know, talking personally speaking. Yeah. That yeah. process could be with the right people on the, with, with an appropriate view and a balanced view and fact-based assessment, etc. Right. And in the past, um, it was fairly well understood or known what individual selectmen thought about Peter and different topics, whether or not full independent evaluations were dispersed or not. I don't even know. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah. At least in the last few years, it was. So. But the, the point is, I, I really don't want this board to waste a lot of time trying to come up with nice things to say or how to say them. That doesn't help any of us. Um, you know, if you like something, just say you like it. And don't waste a lot of adjectives. Get on to the next thing, which, which didn't, didn't work so well. You know, there's always those. Because that's what everyone else needs to know. And the other thing to think about is, how does that feedback fit into the next goal setting process? Because we really should be setting goals, I would say, by the end of August, generally. Mm -hmm. um, because that only gives people from August to May right. to accomplish them, which is fine in most cases. Um, but it probably makes more sense for that feedback to happen before you finalize goals, because some of the goals are going to have to react to <coughs> what we said. Um, and historically, um, some number of you, probably two, ought to sit together and come up with some kind of a form, and I can help you or not as you choose. And um, you know, we can use the old one, we can come up with a new one, and then one or two members kind of shepherd the process in terms of, because I can't do that, you've got to say, look, <coughs> Dan, do you have that filled out yet? Mm -hmm. uh, and then that person gathers it <coughs> because you need to, to keep that to yourself. Do you believe in self-reviews too? I'm happy to do one. Yeah. Um, I find it. I find them sometimes pretty interesting. Yeah, generally people are a little harder on themselves. <coughs> not always. Um, I would think my insight would be helpful to you. Well, the divergence factor is always interesting too. That's like, certainly we're, very interesting. Were we all copacetic? <laughs> yeah, you know you sucked, <laughs> and you know you did well. But oh, you, we thought you yeah. did well, and you didn't think you did well. That's yeah. interesting. Would, That's would it be helpful to do something, or even possible, <clears throat> like a, a two-year? Um, Goal set. I'm talking about a loss of time. So if we're getting this, you know, goal budget. set in September, like you said, you're giving people till May. Yeah. It's a short time period. But if they, if they knew that they could start working in July and August, for example, on that on that second year, because I already had it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it's possible to really come up with something like that. But it seems like it may be helpful. One of the tricky parts is, you know, we evaluate most people in May. 
I and any other supervisor has already handed out goals for next year in May. Nothing to do with anything you may want or not want. That doesn't seem perfect to me, but generally, again, when you sit down and put your heads together and come up with strategic items, we all kind of know what they are. So I would venture to say most of the goals handed out may not show up on your list, but they're important to do. Mm -hmm. And just because they're not in your list may never rise to your level. You may never know about it. You know, we need a new phone system. No, you know about that. <laughs> there's other things that would be very invisible to you, and why shouldn't it be? There's nothing wrong with that. But at department head level, that's where it's a little more tied into what goes on here. Yeah. And to the extent some of them need to push that down, they do, some of them don't. But the timing so, of this will never be perfect. It's not a pipe dream to think that all this stuff can eventually tie up to the strategic plan, is it? Um, or is it? We're, we're too understaffed. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, ideally it should. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, how, how, should ultimately ultimately it has to. how does your yeah. performance affect right. the accomplishment of this overarching? Yeah. yeah. yeah Down to the lowest. The only disconnect the would chain. be yeah. if for some reason we don't communicate well and I say, look, you just don't understand that. 90% of my job is already spoken for. You're only talking about 10. Yeah. You know, if, if there's an issue there with communication, you know, that's our fault. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to make a big deal of the fact that, you know, 53 people called me about Summer Ave in the last four days. That's a certain amount of time, no matter how you slice it. Um, you know, and, and that's someone, if it's not me, it's someone in the organization's handling it. It doesn't matter who. Yeah. Um, that's not something that you can easily measure in a strategic plan, other than no, you can't give customers. No, service. but it all—it has a little, it has a little space that it fits it. It plays in something. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do actually think it all kind of interconnects and in back to the split shift plan. I mean, it, it seems like it has to. Kind of. mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying I think it's critical that you have a four, five, six pillar. You know. Strategic yeah. plan. If it gets bigger than that, it gets unwieldy and it gets unmanageable for you. It's not fair yeah. to the person you're asking to manage it. You know, if it gets too, you know, too widespread. You know, yeah. out of I, category. I can tell you a little bit better from the town hall perspective. Um, it's very challenging for most employees to do what they do in town hall and do this planning and strategic thinking, yeah. because usually what they're doing in town hall is precludes all the other activities. It's marching. They're, they're, they're yeah, marching absolutely. through the stuff that's in front right. of them. Right. Operational. Exactly. Um, and dealing with people coming in the building, reacting to situations. <laughs> that's why if the plan is built in a way that allows it to yeah. wrap around the marching that's going on, it, yeah. you know, that day-to-day that -day <laughs> marching hold, you yeah. know, is the, you know, is kind of the support system for the strategic. Yeah. Probably turn the march column 10 degrees this way. Yeah. Right. Well, Not that way anymore. It allows you to start to affect some of it when it's when it's done in a in a controlled environment. What yeah. um, at least one town hall not far from us is doing. I, I don't want to say who is they're actually um, closed while their employees work certain hours of the week. Close to the public, oh. and that allows this kind of stuff or who knows what it is they do at that time. Uninterrupted tenders. Yeah. It's uninterrupted. Planned on availability. Uh, Peter call. never liked that. I don't hate it as much as he did, but it doesn't feel right to me. Um, you know, you sh we have good hours at Town Hall in total. We're, we're open as many hours as almost any anyone around us uh, because, you know, as employees, we're 37 and a half hours. I think Town Hall's open 40 and a half or something like that. Maybe it's 41 and a half. Um, and then we just juggle hours and cover and stuff like that. 41 and a half hours is good, really good. So how do you rationalize the ADD? Well, that doesn't <laughs> that's voluntary. Time. Just like you. Um, but to get a group of people together to have isolated time, I can find time sometimes. Others can find time to get it together. What are the chances of that happening? That's hard. Yep. And we have a department head meeting once a month. Sometimes we have to cancel it. We, it's just not going to happen. Um, so that's a real challenge, and that's that's a real problem in the organization that we have such a hard time making that time. Yeah, I don't know how to improve that. Is, 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 all of the committees are assigned 
in a way that supports theoretically the you know the employees of the town hall are working in concert with committees. I mean, I know it. You know, it's not like they're sitting at a desk side by side. That's not what I mean. But right, they're they're connected. Yeah. So it makes me wonder. Um, you know, if if we can utilize some volunteer time to you know to help with that. Um, I don't know yeah, if that's possible. I'm just thinking out loud with you about your problem, that particular problem. Certain committees are very self-sustaining. Historical committee is the best example I can think of. Um, they don't have staff help, no. yeah. and, except in very limited instances. Mm -hmm. um, other boards and committees have a significant amount of staff help. There's not a right or a wrong here, it's just that everyone's different. Yeah, I mean, you know, you and I went to the Board of Health, yeah. you know, and, it, and that's yeah. very intensively involved in paid staff as well as, you know, right. a small right. group. So um, it does make you wonder sometimes if there's, I mean, I know we try to support you as best we can, and there's some things we can yeah, do with and other things we can't. Right. Um, but um, I think that there's kind of that open willingness to say, if you got a yeah. task for us, tell us and we'll see what we can yeah, do. Yeah, and I, I will say I, I greatly appreciate that, and not every board is like that in town. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason is because they haven't sat down and seen the whole pie. Exactly. You know, and they haven't heard from you as a, as a board who appoints most of them. Yeah. What is it you think we should be doing? You know, and then some of them have, uh, have their own uh, mission absent you and your thoughts. They have state law. Yeah. They have town bylaws. Right. So they don't even have to care what you think. You know, they're following these rules. It's interesting, though. The thing that Kevin and Dan have been doing this year so far, though, is by having everybody come in. Yeah. I, I think is very helpful. I think that helps. It, it really creates a, it, it allows a dialogue. Well, we haven't had everybody. We've had boards that I think have had issues. <laughs> well, issues, but not only that, aren't you aren't you speaking to people who are being renewed? If, if I there mean, are that's, people, I guess, what I'm saying. So well, if there's an opportunity there. It's flexible. People yeah. are, are uh, seeking uh, an incumbent spot. We will have them all coming. Yeah. For example, on any board. So I, think, I don't think anyone questions the fact that the volunteers virtually all mean very well mm -hmm. and have their hearts yeah, in the right place. Right. Nobody goes and to the so board meeting and say, I'm, "I'm really going to stink." I'm going to sabotage. That's right. right. <laughs> but given that, they don't know what helps, yeah. if you will, the whole town. That's why well, the vision they sometimes thing is really have a, They have a very specific vision right. about what they're doing, yeah. and that one vision could actually be hurting a larger and vision. Right. A lot of our questioning the subcommittees along that very line, like the bigger picture in mind is this. Mm -hmm. How does that? How do you fit what you do into this? And, you know. And some of them will rightly tell you, my responsibility is to say no. Someone else says yes. Mm -hmm. As long as they understand that, and they understand how it fits in the big picture, that's okay. But it's when they don't really know, oh, some, we were potentially going to say yes to that? Yeah. Why? So, but logically, when we've talked about it, I don't know how you get a lot of people in the room from a schedule standpoint. Chairs and vice chairs, I think you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, have with three months' notice, let's say, you can get a good attendance. But again, it, you know, they may or may not come. But if you're looking for information from those yeah. those groups, what makes sense is to get on the agenda at one of those meetings. Sure. Go to Absolutely. them and really, you know. Yeah, and if liaisons to groups those. wants to start going to meetings, I'd be happy to come to a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, just to deliver some sort of a message. Uh, look, mm -hmm. here's what we're doing. Here's what we'd like from you. If you have any feedback, knock yourselves out. Just to make sure their opinions are worthwhile. You know, I don't know what they think. Some of them know that, some of them probably don't. They see you once a year or once every three years. So, so in our July 10th packet, Bob did distribute his final update for fiscal 14 of the goals and actions he undertook. What I think we ought to do is have, as was suggested, have two of us put together a review matrix and evaluate those formally for this year. Next year's goals can come out of this visioning, or in part mm -hmm. out of this visioning process. Is there a volunteer or volunteers that would be willing to take that material and craft a, uh, a proposed score sheet? I guess that could be one of those people. Okay, we have, have Dan, who mm -hmm. else? 
I, I could work with Dean on that. Okay. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, unless somebody else has an interest in doing that or wants to join the party. I, I'd be happy to t tag along. I've got a crazy schedule this next couple of weeks. That's, what I, that's the reason I raised my hand is I'm just trying to, you know. And, and, on the reasons why I didn't raise my hand. Then you need to have a meeting, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people are really busy. Right. And they're, you know, so, so would it be Dan and I just stick around and guard the community. A, come up with a <laughs> format <laughs> and we're saying an empty template and then we'll all kind of vote on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free. Good. That sounds and I did want to ask the board, um, you're scheduled to have one meeting in August and three in September. Mm -hmm. I don't, absent a possible meeting with the RMLD commissioners, just that aside, uh, I don't think you need to meet three times in September. Yeah. You should meet on September 2nd, but if you want to look at the other two meetings and tell me which nights are better or worse, like, I don't know, 16th and 23rd, I think it is. Yeah, that would make sense. Should we make one of those division? I think, I think one of those should be a meeting and one of those should be as needed. Yeah. And I, I don't think the RMLD situation is going to fit into September. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Sharon and I talked about it. Um, It'll be that long? Just because of her workload. She's oh, going to have a hard time. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. She's hitting right. yeah. yeah. She, she's really under the gun right now. And just to, just to be clear, um, if, if we're having a September 29th town meeting, which you'll decide soon, Mm -hmm. um, in order to use free cash, she has to be certified by the state oh, in September. So she has to Otherwise, really we can't use free cash or reserves from the enterprise funds. Yeah, so she really and, and there is at least one instance where we absolutely need funding. So we could be slightly disingenuous and say, let's just take 100 grand out of health insurance and put it over there for now. We'd have to tell town meeting, look, we have to put it back, but we can't legally do it yet. So she's really working hard to get that done so as okay. to avoid that kind of a discussion. Okay. But her investigation is, for all intents and purposes, completed, so right up and, okay. yeah. Okay. She, she still asked a couple questions today, but I think okay. she's already finished. Um, would we want to use that third uh, day in September as an attempt to get together over this? It seems like it makes idea. sense to do a Over which thing? The uh, getting the department heads together in an evening, or devote that Saturday of that week for that purpose. Saturday morning. I would say the Tuesday night would probably be a good idea. And if you do just meet two or less of you, it's not a public meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, we've tried to schedule, and I've, I've got one in the fall, you know, workshop meetings, but it's hard to really take everything else and say, you know, the public, you're not welcome tonight. I, I know some are having a problem, but we're having a workshop tonight. <laughs> you, know, you can't practice. If you're going to have a selectman's meeting, a certain public. amount of that's going to be spoken for by other people, whether you like it or not. And it, it's clear that that is an ever-growing, yeah. you know, portion of the, of the meeting. But so, to that you, end, yeah, you and I, can, but I you mean, can if that's a two-person two. thing, yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's only two of us. That's fine. We'll meet with the heads and we'll... And we can, up. you know, whatever time you can get here, honestly, morning, noon, or night, but we work till Tuesdays at 7, so anything within that reasonable time frame is not hard for department heads anyways. Yeah. And Tuesday night's good because usually the other folks doing board meetings, Gene especially, does not have Tuesday nights because of the selectmen. So that is a nice time frame. I could probably get here earlier if I knew the date in advance. And, you know, maybe we get okay. started at 5. Does that help? Sure. Or 6? Or I mean, I, you know, I could make almost any kind of yeah. a schedule. Okay. Right. That, you know, so Let me give a little see what advance I notice. Know about right. one, of the, one of the committees wanted to commit the climate protection or whatever they are right. committee. <laughs> they keep changing their name. Um, you, did they ask you, because they were on an agenda, and I think yes. I... Yes, they, they have that. They're one of those two dates, right. I think they're probably flexible, so I'll and find out. That's the only agenda item I wasn't positive whether there was flexibility as to move them. Mm -hmm. So we'll find out if they have flexibility, and then we'll get back to you. And That's I the report that we've gotten a copy of electronically? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some time ago. I was going to say in the spring. It, just as April. an aside, I, you know, our next meeting is not until August 19th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we got to get together before that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to be, uh, I am going to be out of town, well, you know, during that meeting. I, I will be out of town without meeting us. So I don't know what that means to. Marcy, are you available remotely or you're in the wrong time zone? It's the 19th. Uh, uh, I, I could, I, I think I can be. I, I may have right. a, a connectivity issue for the benefit of the So the 19th is a question mark. 
to the site. I, I noted that the Historical Commission made their quorum by remote participation for the uh, dem demolition. I didn't know that. One of them phoned in, and they had that four or five, I think. The Carl Carl Midnight uh, phoned yeah. in. Yeah. It is a little. You can tell he can't hear because he doesn't always respond when his yeah. name is called. So it's not perfect. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So. Well, keeping the tempo is hard too. Yeah. You know. To to really get that to work effectively, the, the system you need is so expensive. Yes. Right. You know, it's more than this. Yeah. Well, it's it's not just it's that you need worth. you need a system, and then you, you need truly you need to uh, remain constant on the on the end of the people where there are most people to set to 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 ask of the remote person. You know, do you have something to say? Because a lot of times they can't cut it. There's not really an opportunity. To cut Great. It. So it, it makes it a little harder. It, there's yeah. more of an onus on the people in the room. Yeah, true. Really, yeah. To make it work. And I've asked other boards and committees to <coughs> chime in, and very few have used it. Mm -hmm. okay. the school committees never used it. They saw no really? use in it. Mm -hmm. But the current school committee may have a different opinion. But that was the prior school committee. Well, I, I mean, I think it's important. It, it depends on the makeup of the people on it. Um, you know. um, EDC so. used it a week or two ago. Uh, I didn't know this. There's a handful. And it's got to be phone. We can't Skype in or? Well, that's what your policy says now, which is why I stuck it on an agenda. Yeah. <laughs> um, if it's Skype, it has to be up there so the public right. can see it. It can't be there. Okay. Well, they can, how will they hear so you got to think about what you're doing on the <laughs> other <laughs> end. <laughs> well, how will well, they then hear the problem it? is how does the public then see any, any projected materials? Right. You know what I mean? There's a, it's a little bit more. Yeah, you have to have to. Oh, yeah, because you got well, The mics would have to somehow get up here. feed the Skype feed. Uh, I don't think so. They're both we can it's the here. same. It's, but it's the audio as as portion it's of Skype. Well, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it would help solve the problem, and especially the if, it's a, problem. if it's a two-way thing, then you yeah. can, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to cut in. It's to easier to <laughs> Yeah, hey, right. they gotta, uh, hey, don't forget yeah. that. Yeah, and I don't know if we have cameras on these, but we could easily find a lot of talks to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, Marcy, you're a question mark for the 19th or indefinite? Um, I, I believe I'm going to be able to call in remotely. Okay, right. and John, you're a definite on the 19th. I'm definitely not here. Definitely not here. Okay, so we're we're down to minimum fishing game. Oh yeah, we have three. Is a different date in August better? Uh, 12th or 26th? Definitely. I don't remember. 12th would be much better for me. 12th would work, work for you. Would work for me. How about you, Marcy? I think it works for me. Yeah, I'd be all right. <coughs> you can just. I don't know if people are going to say, yeah, I'll be all right. And then look at the phone. <laughs> it's, it's easy to put those contacts no, obviously in the other machine. <laughs> the other machine if you want. Not for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Hmm. I usually can't tell you tomorrow if I'm free unless I like my phone. Um, I don't get matters to me. I don't know. Oh, yeah. The 12th is actually better for Yeah. Me. Can we move it? All right. Let's try that. Okay. Um, I'll send you an email tomorrow to confirm it. I might find an issue. But, you know, someone might have the room, but we'll throw that right. out. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Last topic for tonight is uh, approval of minutes from our July 15th Move meeting. The Board of Selectmen approve the minutes of July 15th, 2014 as amended. Do I have a second? Second. Marcy seconds. Are there any edits yeah. or changes? <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Paula James and just look at me. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm not. Uh, let's see, I don't know what page this is, sorry. Uh, page two, uh, the discussion about the bucket trucks. There's a sentence that begins with my name, noted a lineman who purchases vehicles, works many hours of overtime, and he has a side job. The, the, the point I think you're making The is point this I must was making is, does, how, 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 can does, how can he work a side job? How, how does he have enough time for a side job, really? Um, because that's something that I wanted um, additional <coughs> research on. Really. Um, and then there was one other point, I think it was on the next page. There's a place where it asked about a website, but it, that wasn't, it was not me who made the comment. I actually think it was John Halsey. Which one? On page five? It's where it was um, review of FY14 town manager goals is the, is the heading. And the last sentence. Um, 
as Mark Seagrass indicated, the website looks good, but is not fresh. But I'm certain that I did not say that. I think, John, you said something about the website. But I, 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 know it was I might have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take that out. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Any other uh, proposed changes? So you have that edit, Paula? Yes. Great. All those in favor of the amended minutes? 5-0. The only other comment for me related to these minutes is there was an article in the um, Reading Chronicle, which you may or may not have seen. It was a letter to the editor by Mr. Brown mm -hmm. asserting that this board and the chairman in particular didn't have the authority to um, uh, cause the RMLD to uh, describe where it had spent the funds, or it wasn't a best, it also was not a good use of our time. Um, my own read of the Mass General Laws, and again, as it's been proven at least twice tonight, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> um, but Section 56 is, it seems to be on point where it says that uh, all of the accounts rendered or kept in the gas or electric plant or any city shall be subject to the inspection of the city auditor. Mm -hmm and shall be subject to the inspection of the selectmen. So yeah, cool. is it is certainly oversight for our raising questions having to do with the spending of money or the disposition of funds. Well, so I, I think that was, I, yeah. I, uh, I don't, first I of all, I didn't comment on that. No, anytime I get it, it is, maybe it's a, uh, I just ignore that. Sometimes you, everybody's entitled to an opinion. You give things more life than they deserve by commenting on them. Yeah. Just for the uh, for those who are still awake at this late hour, you may see this on, on RCTV. Uh, is that being the case? I'm sorry, Bob. Um, one other comment, um, because there's been some questioning about similarly Sharon's authority. Yes, I was yeah. but um, just so you know what she did, she actually called the DOR first, really? and they said, "What's your guidance? Outline the situation." Mm -hmm. Um, explain the relationship. We have more than one town, so we're a little different. It's not a town department in the traditional sense. Right. Uh, offered to or sent the charter, I don't know. And DOR gave her an opinion and cited the same thing you just read mm -hmm. and said, absolutely. You, ha you, more than anyone else, have the not only the authority, but the, the responsibility. And, and, and even the FinCom. The FinCom has the right to investigate the they can books investigate of everybody. Anyone. Right. right. Everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we had the obligation to do that. That's the more the point. We so have too. the obligation. Yeah. It's funny. People though. who are in this room tonight have an expectation of us. And if not us, who? You know, right? right. Of the course. guy in the street is not going to have the time. And, and sometimes we can, we can always look out for the citizen's best interest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are limited by statute as to what right. we can do about it, but you know. There's always the bully pulpit, as they say. Um, anyway, I just I did want to respond to that letter well, in in the, to the extent others had read it and thought yeah. there was merit to it. So. Unfortunately, I lost that issue, so I never spread it. <laughs> um, if there's no other topics, it is quarter of 11. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. All those in favor? Second. Second. <laughs> Five zero. Ten forty two. All right. Thank you, everyone. And good night. Yes. Bob, I apologize. I got a phone call this morning. I got wrapped up.